Talk Daily with Andrew Hustler Patterson and Michael Remus. What is going on, gang? Welcome to another edition of Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Big win last night to close out the homestand. Loren Brassois' best game of the season. And after a tough start to a four-game homestand, the Jets end up uh, coming out even with two wins on Saturday against the Blackhawks and last night against the Carolina Hurricanes. And now it is off to Colorado to take on the Avalanche on Thursday night. Jets did practice, and we'll uh, we'll uh, get into that in uh, just a, a couple of minutes. Um, a familiar face back on the ice today for the first time in a long time. Um, and we'll chop up all the latest Jets topics with Sean Reynolds. Rennie's going to pop by. Fun k last night after a big win with Ken live on location. And Mike McIntyre is going to join us as well. We will get into that crazy Monday nighter as well. What a what an unbelievable performance by Jake Browning last night. A, a historic performance by the NFL for an undrafted quarterback in his second start. Uh, and on the other side of things, Trevor Lawrence, injured, high ankle sprain. He will certainly miss time. What does this mean for Nathan Rourke? We'll ask Dave Naylor a little later on, as well as look at the crazy wildcard races of both the NFC and the AFC. Um, Going to be a great show, though, folks, and uh, looking forward to getting after it. Welcome to everybody in chat. Shout out to the podcast listeners. Uh, I was just down at Little Brown Jug getting ready for tomorrow's festivities. Again, we'd love to see you tomorrow. Uh, WST holiday party, 7 p.m. All money's going to the Christmas cheer board at this time. So if you haven't already, grab a ticket. I think it's eleven ninety-eight. We're putting all that money to the cheer board. And I've got to give uh, a big thanks to uh, my pal Dorian Morphy over at the uh, Winnipeg Jets. We've got a couple really cool things for our raffle we're gonna just do a you know simple raffle to try raise a little bit more money for the cheer board so by the way bring some cash if you can i i think we'll probably need to do that cash wise um but we're gonna have a great merchandise and beer package from little brown jug and i just picked up an autograph framed kyle connor picture an autograph kyle connor puck a jets hoodie and working on a couple other fun things. So uh, hopefully not only will we have a great time raising money for a great cause, but some of you will go and be going home with uh, some great stuff as well. So anyways, link is in the description of this video. And if you're on the podcast, just go to winnipegsportstalk.com. Try and do that today. We're just firming up numbers. And we do have a limited capacity at Little Brown Jug. It should be a great night. So see you tomorrow. Count yourselves in. Let's have a good time. Uh, let me just, before we bring in Michael Remus, give a big shout out to... All the great sponsors that make this show happen each and every day. The gang at Cool Bet Canada, Princess Auto, Royal Sports, Boston Pizza, the Winnipeg Jets, Little Brown Jug hosting the party tomorrow night. Nick and Nicky DQ. I don't know. Nick is fired up. He's going to come by with some ice cream treats for everyone. And a special thanks to our sponsors at Boston Pizza who will be uh, delivering some pies so everyone can uh, you know, have a slice, a little ice cream to go with Winnipeg's favorite local beer, Little Brown Jug. Um, also, the gang at F Apparel, Wallace & Wallace, Vita Health Fresh Market, Canadian Club, Manitoba Battery, Aquatech, and Modern Man Barbershop. And we'll certainly get to a why not question of the day for our friends at Not Auto Corp at Waverly and McGilvery. Let's get this show on the road and get Michael Remus in here. Remus, what's up? I'm feeling good, Huss. As you said, we're counting down to this uh, holiday gathering tomorrow, and it's going to be great to see uh, see everyone there. and. Yeah, just uh, basking in the glow of this uh, Jets win. Uh, we talked so much about Lauren Brossois uh, needing a good performance. And, oh, boy, do we get that last night. Uh, what an awesome night. And didn't the Jets look great in those uh, 48 oh. jerseys? I know a lot of people uh, not happy. or I don't know. There was a lot of... Uh, it was, I don't know, emotional reaction uh, when they were released. Uh, you and I thought they looked good. I mean, Baby Blue, MLB's been doing Baby Blue for a while. Blue Jays, Royals, Royals. Twins, uh, rocking Baby Blue. Not enough Baby Blue in the NHL. You know, everyone loves the Powder Blue Chargers. But uh, I thought the full kit looked great. Brossois, it was definitely uh, the pads and the, and the glove. Blocker looking strong. And the Jets going with the gloves. I do wonder 
what it would look like if the Jets also had uh, the, the pants, the same color as the gloves, but I think the Navy looks good as pants as well. So uh, they look good and played well enough to win. Look good, feel good, play good. Uh, wasn't a masterpiece by any stretch of the imagination. And Carolina shoots from everywhere. Hell, they shoot from the dressing room. Uh, and they put a lot of rubber. They put a lot of rubber on Lauren Brassois, but he was up to the task. And you want to talk about look good, feel good, play good? That was LB. As you mentioned, we'll get into his performance on the ice ream. But honest to God, that was one of the coolest goalie kits I've ever seen. Like the the way that that blended in with the uni like the style and of course you know part of the, the canadian military appreciation night um which was uh which was very well done we'll get to a couple things in and around that in a moment um lb looked the part and man did he play the part last night i thought and I, listen everyone knows i'm a big hellebuck guy i have a feeling when when the when the pads and everything came in if I'm Hellbuck, I would have looked over to LB and went, damn, I wish I did that. Like, I would be a little jealous. Like, that, he looked that good. Like, with the, you know, the old school blocker and the pads, the way they did it up. Can't say enough about the way that turned out. And it just added so much more to a jersey. There's the picture. Like, <laughs> I mean, that was just, I mean, 10 out of 10, if you ask me. Yeah, 10 out of 10. Uh, pretty awesome. And the Jets did tweet out a video of Hellbuck's mask. Uh, you know, he also got a mask design for these jerseys. His look good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this looks pretty awesome. And Brossois was great. And you mentioned Carolina shooting from everywhere. I mean, you're absolutely right. And, and you asked the Jets, so yeah, they had a lot of shots, but a lot of them are for the outside. Brossois was able to see lots of them. And he needed, uh, he needed a, a very good game uh, today, you know, just... But the Yossi goal from last from last time still left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. And look, he saw everything. Uh, he stopped them all. And who's this? Jarvis in this picture? Look at his eyes there. Just can't believe Lauren Brossois. <laughs> just stoning him over. Poor Seth coming back home and getting stoned by LB last night. He, yeah. Uh, to your point, though, I mean, listen, he, he did need a big game. Um, he hasn't played a lot. Uh, and listen, I do feel for his situation too, because Reem, I think we all recall when he signed here, like it was very, very unsure as to whether Hellebuck would even start the season with the Winnipeg Jets. So in the time between LB signing, thinking there's a good chance that maybe he would be left as the starter, he's now playing against a bit playing behind a Vezina trophy winner that just signed a seven year extension after this. And I, I his situation changed, and I'm not sure how that, you know, affected him, if at all. I mean, he's a professional, and you got to go out and do your job. Um, but there was a number of games, starting with the game against Vegas. I thought he was shaky against Montreal, and certainly that game against uh, Nashville was not one of his finest games. And I think there was a real pressure to perform. And we had talked that, okay, maybe they'll give him the Blackhawks to try to get the confidence going. No, they put Hellebuck in. And LB went out and took on the Carolina Hurricanes, one of the top teams in the NHL. And he was absolutely full marks last night. And a uh, the biggest reason, one of many, but the biggest reason why the Jets got two points and a very deserving first star in the game last night. Yeah, we talked about the schedule coming in, being like, well, if you can't trust Brossois against the Blackhawks, who can you trust You know him against? And... You know, looking, you know, maybe that was your initial reaction, but looking at the schedule, I don't think it was about trust. It was about maximizing rest for Hellebuck. So what, he plays Saturday, then has one, two, three, four full days in a row instead of maybe playing Brossois, having one day, then having t having uh, two days here between yesterday's game and Thursday night in Denver. So trying to, you know, maximize his rest. And Brossois has played well against Carolina and... He certainly played well yesterday. You know, you know, looking at the shots here from Money Puck, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned what shooting from the dressing room, and you're pretty much right. I mean, look how many of these shots are from the boards, from the blue line, uh, pretty far away, and the Jets are more concentrated uh, in and around the net. And you can certainly see, hey, if you know Brossois can see these, he should be able to stop them. And I know there's a lot in here near the net where. 
Uh, he was certainly very, very good. I wonder if one of those was, you know, it's funny, they scored one goal, but they didn't even go in off a Carolina player, went in off DeMello State. Yeah. So I don't know if he gets uh, any <laughs> credit credit for that, but uh, again, a great game, and you wonder if, he, you know, they'll be uh, more eager to put him in uh, sooner than they have, you know, coming into this one. A lot of talk about the kits. The chocolate brown two-tone trapper was sick from Schickster. Agreed. LB wear that outfit every game he starts, even if the team is in whites or dark blue. <laughs> we can get behind that. Joel Kevin said, and you know, I'll be, I'll be honest, I was at this game, I didn't notice this. Did LB change his glove in the middle of the game? It seemed like it was black or close to it. I'll be honest, I'm I'm not uh, I am not sure. Jay Miller wondering if the gear is being option auctioned. I have not heard that. Um, and then Larry TSG, the uh, the ray of sunshine as always. <laughs> I don't like the poofy blue. Yeah. <clears throat> I gotta tell you, I it it, it looked <laughs> it looked so good. <laughs> uh, and the way the numbers um, with the white outline popped off. I mean, we're kind of uni geeks, um, uh, so I could talk about this for a while, but. I mean, I liked the way the jersey looked, and we'd seen lots of fans wearing them. I saw Dan at the game rocking a Velarde 48. Nice uh, nice work there, Dan. Um, but I really did think that put it all together with the uh, the brown gloves and everything, it was a great look. And uh, we're going to get a chance to see that the next time we get together with the WST crew remote because that Saturday night game against the Toronto Maple Leafs at the end of January is one of the other two games. I'll be honest, I don't know what the other game is, but I know that the Jets will be wearing those uh, against the Leafs on the 27th of January, our next game. Yeah, I really like uh, the number font, and uh, it seemed like a great night uh, for military appreciation where they had the live band uh, there, Huss, which I think added a nice little atmosphere on what break and play and intermission. It was great. The the, the band, and they, they had done it before, and I'm sitting there with uh, with my pal that I was at the game with, going, man, that guy in the band looks like Soul Bear, yeah. who has done a few of the anthems. And as we came in to the game, I'm like, I got to ask this. He just looks so much like it. I texted Balls over at the game. I said, is that Soul Bear in the military band? Yes, he's the singer. Anthems and also in the rock band, uh, really good. I, I'll be honest, he, I think, listen, no disrespect to any of the other anthem singers that we have had, and we've got many great ones. Stacy, of course, Beverly Wynn, Ashley, uh, Soul Bear is unreal. Um, and then, you know, they had, like, at one point they were doing, like, Ozzy, they did a bunch of, like, ACDC songs, Oh, man, it, it certainly did add. I mean, it wasn't a great crowd, and I think we all expected that after, you know, four games in a row, two of the biggest crowds of the year on Thursday and Sunday, a Monday night game starting at 6.30. They were sort of up against it, but uh, it certainly did. Um, it added a lot to the uh, the atmosphere of the game. And the crowd themselves, oh, they're so bear. The crowd themselves, uh it was it was pretty funny. I mean, obviously we're all sitting there looking Carolina like right off the bat at six nothing in shots, and then it's ten nothing, and then it's twelve nothing, and we're into the second half of the first period. And it wasn't like the Jets never had the puck, um, but I believe it was Big Stan threw one at the net. We thought it was a shot. They put it up on the board. Everyone sort of did. All right, we got a shot, and then they took it off the board, and then everybody booed. <laughs> It was pretty funny. The good thing about it is about 27 seconds later after that first shot went in, the first goal went in, Kyle Connor roofing one. Um, and i got to tell you, we'll talk and we should have led with LB because of the game that he played. But, dude, uh, Ehlers, Shifley, and Connor are starting to feel it together a little more. I still wasn't sure how this would work. I'm not sure whether it's the long term, the way things are going to look. But when you've got a talent like Ehlers – I, I respect Rick Bonus for giving this a little bit more time to see what can happen, especially with Velarde back. And, you know, he and I have fallow playing with Cole Perfetti on that line too. Um, you saw at times just how – remember when Shifley was talking about playing with magical players? He's got a couple of them right now. And the potential for that line 
if they can really hit their peak, I think is going to scare the hell out of a lot of teams in the NHL. Yeah, I mean, those guys, you saw the skill, but it took a while for it to come out. I mean, Carolina, what, they were on pucks, passing it around. They looked really good. But again, you know, a lot of some of their shots has you know, not exactly the uh, most of the high danger variety, a lot from the outside. And Brossois certainly, you know, he spoke after the game. We'll get to that clip. Uh, you know, got him ready, I think, uh, facing that much rubber early. And meanwhile, Antti Ranta, who doesn't have great numbers this year, has been sitting there getting cold, and they got one shot. And then next thing you know, uh, you know, Kyle Connor beats his man, and Ehlers finds him, and he's all alone. And, uh, you know, leave that guy all alone, and he, he's going to find the back of the net. But, you know, seven minutes in, shot attempts, 15 to 1. Uh, actual shots on goal with 3.30 left were 12 nothing until Ehlers got one and you know it was it just reminded me of you know those games you play on a uh, playstation has where like you're doing everything but scoring and then the first shot of the opponent goes in you're like ah oh, this game is rigged what is this and you you toss your toss rage your controller quit. yeah and then you yeah rage quit but uh credit to the jets hanging in there and uh it had to feel good you know after a period like that uh you know leaving with a, a one nothing lead uh, and what a beautiful goal it was uh, from well, Ehlers to Connor. Yeah, I mean, listen, we'll hear from Bones, LB, and Ehlers in a minute, a little bit more on that line. Um, but, you know, after, you know, a real tough week where the Jets lost three in a row, including that heartbreaker against the Oilers, the way things turned around, a big win on Saturday to break the streak, and finishing it off with a win over the Carolina Hurricanes. And lo and behold, guess what? The Jets are two points out of first place right now in the Central again. Colorado, who is hosting the Jets on Thursday, 32 points in 24 games. The Dallas Stars are at 31 <clears throat> with 23 games played. And then you've got the Jets at 30 points in 24. And it's a good thing because the Red Hot Arizona Coyotes have done something that no team in NHL history has done, go on a five-game winning streak, beating all of the last five Stanley Cup champs. And the Blues are playing pretty well as well. They went in Vegas last night, so they're at 27. Both wild cards right now coming out of the Central. And I don't think a lot of people had that on their bingo card when we got the regular season going. Yeah, I mean, everyone uh, right now, I'm tuning in the NHL Network today, talking about the Arizona Coyotes. Uh, they're in a wild card spot. They're on a five-game win streak, as you mentioned, beating with the last five Stanley Cup champions. Uh, trivia question, who, who do we have here? Vegas, Washington. St. Louis, Colorado, and Tampa, and Arizona, man, they're plus 14 goal differential. Connor Ingram was just player of the week. He got a shutout last night against uh, against Washington. So yeah, they were on a five game, but the Jets, look, in their last 10, 7-3-0, and, oh, and that was the three losses last week, and now they look, they get them back two in a row, and they're still in the third, uh, playing Colorado Thursday. Colorado in an action tonight. They're missing, or... Kale McCarr is a game-time decision, so we'll have to see about him. That would be a big boost for the Jets if he didn't play Thursday. But the Jets, hey, they're at full strength now. Give uh, McCarr all the time he needs. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah give him <laughs> the MVP candidate, Kale McCarr. But uh, here's here's the standings. Uh, they're right in there, Huss. Uh, you have to feel good about uh, the way it's going here. Well, and of course, I mean, what was it, two weeks ago, um, you know, on the Saturday, the Jets and Dallas and Colorado were all tied for first place. And then, boom, you lose three in a row, and next thing you know, you're six points back, and there's teams on your heels. Um, so that was a big one for the team last night, to uh, salvage a two-and-two -two homestand um, and get to within two points heading into Colorado on Thursday. Listen, there's lots to get to. Um, we've got Team Canada and Team USA WJC rosters. Um Andre Vasilevsky ripping one in a press conference last night after the game. Uh, I'm sure yeah, we'll discuss by rip, that ripping later one, on. You mean ripping a fart, just so everyone knows. Yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah if if you, you haven't seen one, absolutely letting one go uh, and then turning <laughs> red-faced as, as he did it. There, listen, lots of laughs about that last night. Um, but let's get to uh, just what we heard after the game. LB was the player of the game, and uh, he... Kept the game close early on when Carolina came out hot. Here's Bones on uh, the start of his team and the Carolina Hurricanes last night. They came out flying and uh, they were putting a lot of pressure on us. It's, uh, 
it's the exact type of game we thought we, we, we told them that was going to happen and they're going to come there's four lines over there and there's 60 and they're all good they're big and they can all skate and they just throw it north and they're coming at you and uh, they make it very difficult to to get your game going but you know we had some looks in the first period when we missed the net um so yeah sometimes you got to bend a little bit but we didn't break and that's the most important thing all right, uh, one more from Bones. Um, praising Loren Brassois, who was the game's number one star. You're not going to beat that team without great goaltending. They just throw everything they can at the net from every angle. And again, their forwards are all big, strong, and fast, and they get in there. They're tough to defend. Uh, and you're not going to beat that team without great goaltending the way they play. Uh, and Rick Bonus got great goaltending, not from Connor Hellebuck, from LB last night. And, um, you know, he, uh, as I mentioned, a very deserving first star of the game. But I think a massive game for him. Um, just, you know, the way things went down, the goal that he let in in Nashville, how crucial that was. I mean, to come back and play the way he did yesterday, um, very important for him and the team. Here's Brassois on uh, a very good night at the office in a very good-looking kit. Uh, to be honest, I kind of like getting a, a lot of shots early and often. And it gets me into the game, and uh, but we knew they were going to do that. That's kind of their MO. They throw everything on net, and especially in the first period, and they did that tonight and uh, got me into the game. How did the structure in front of you look, uh, help me? I thought it was good. I thought they're they're pushing the first period. I mean, you got to tip the cap. Um, they're playing fast. They're playing hard, uh, and they earned a lot of chances. And then I thought in the second two periods, uh, even though they had a lot of shots, our guys were keeping them to the outside, letting me see pucks. Um, and I thought our guys did a great job uh, of relieving pressure when necessary, too. Is it fair to call this, I guess, your best game, your most feeling like yourself game of the season so far? For sure. T today I felt more like myself, uh, more like I did last year, and, um, and I'm looking to harness that and, and continue on uh, on that path. Well, I can tell you that from a fan standpoint, you can uh, only – have uh, a lot more confidence in Loren Brassois after that performance last night. I'm sure the same goes for uh, for the club. Um, but you can hear how important that game was to him um, afterwards. And uh, he was whooping it up, uh, going out and getting the curtain call for the uh, number one star last night in the game. One more clip, and then we'll uh, bring in Rennie, get his take on uh, the homestand and a look ahead to this road trip. Uh, but Nikolai Ehlers, Rennie might call it snake charming. Uh, others would say uh, just three elite players really feeling it last night. There was some beautiful passing, two big goals from that line. Here's what Ehlers had to say about the play of line one, along with Mark Shifley and Kyle Connor, who were very impactful last night. You know, they're a really good team. They're going to get, you know, ozone time and all of that. Um, but I think we were pretty good most of the game of keeping them from the high scoring chances. Um, and offensively, we were able to score two, so um, we got to keep that going. Do you feel like the ball said that there's no panic in the group tonight? Did you feel that way, that there was no panic on the bench when Carolina took over for stretches? Um, yes, not on the bench. Um, I mean, on the ice, I don't think there was panic, but, you know, when they get going like they do and, and they keep getting first on pucks, we, uh, we got to get a little better there um we got to get pucks out all of us um and get pucks deep you know we uh we they create some turnovers that lead to, to them getting a lot of ozone time so um that's something that uh we need to clean up all right there's nikolai ehlers who uh had a a, a moment that will be on plenty of highlight reels after uh, his beautiful goal courtesy of his line mates and then doing the spinorama on the knees into the corner afterwards. Another great shot from what happened last night. We'll see what Rennie's got to say about that coming up later on. Hey, just before we get to that, Remo, you think Rennie's ever been in a scrum like the one that uh, happened after the Tampa-Dallas game last night? Uh, like where someone, like, laughed in it or someone, <laughs> someone the person being interviewed uh, farted and laughed yeah. at his own? You know what? Let, let's play the clip um, because a lot of people are asking for it. Um, for you uh, podcast listeners, I think you still will be able to hear this. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but um, this is how you bounce back. Uh, you get waxed eight to one by a team. You get another shot against them. Uh, and you shut them out for nothing. And certainly everyone in the Central Division appreciated that. But uh, if you're wondering what all the fuss was about Vasilevsky's post-game interview, <laughs> this is what happened last night in Tampa. Last 48 hours from the end of the game on Saturday to the start of this one. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously it wasn't a great feeling uh, last game, but... Um, Uh, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, it's my turn. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I just um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was just. Uh... It was him. Like, I mean, he didn't look anywhere else. He didn't try to blame it on anyone. I think that was pretty much. Uh, ownership of it as much as it was somewhat uncomfortable considering it was in front of multiple cameras and microphones yeah i mean this is this is uh you know first segment news here on winnipeg sports talk a player <laughs> farting during a during a scrum but, i mean it's pretty clear he, he did it mid-sentence laughed and forgot the question. Well done, uh, Vasilevsky, and a big, big comeback win for Tampa. I mean, they got waxed, as you said, by Dallas, and uh, got him back last night. So, a uh, big shout out for him, and uh, <laughs> and yeah, it was a nice little post game. That was a classic post game interview right there. <laughs> it certainly was. Hey, a big win for Tampa after they got humiliated by Dallas on the weekend, eight one. All right, Sean Reynolds of Sportsnet's going to jump on with us right away, um, folks. The holidays are here. And whether it is for holiday gathering or gift giving, our friends at Canadian Club have you WST years covered. Uh, great gift options for whatever you're looking for with sales on all of the Canadian Club favorites, original 100% rye and CC Classic 12-year-old. And don't forget, there are still bottles of the limited release 15-year-old Canadian Club sherry cask still available. The CC Invitation Series 15-year-old sherry cask, which is the signature CC Classic 12-year-old, finished with a secondary aging in Oloroso sherry casks. All the hallmarks of classic Canadian club with the added richness and sweetness of sherry. $79.99 right now, available at your local Manitoba Liquor Mart. And uh, don't forget to please enjoy responsibly during the holiday season and Always. Um, it's going to be nice for the next couple of days, and we are here for it. But we all know that winter's coming. Uh, is your car or your truck ready for what's on the other side? And that is a deep freeze at some point. Uh, you don't want to be stuck on the side of the road calling a friend for a boost or a new battery when you know you probably needed one already. Get ready for winter and let Manitoba Battery take care of you. You can shop local. Get the best prices in town, beating the pants off the big box stores. And even better than that, when you're already getting the best deal in town, how about not even have to leave your home? Because Manitoba Battery will deliver it to you anywhere inside the perimeter for free with any purchase over 60 bucks. It's just that easy. So head on down to manitobabattery.com to order. Give them a phone call at 204-783-8787 or Pop by and see them for a free battery test to see how you're making out or visit them in person at 1026 Logan Avenue over at Manitoba Battery. Uh, our friends at Aquatech are ready for 2024. And uh, no, I think a lot of people, particularly coming out of the pandemic, you know, realize that maybe the best gift you can give yourself is something to beautify or improve your home. And whole home renovations start with Aquatech. With thousands of renos as their foundation, Aquatech, Aquatech can upgrade any space in your home. If you're ready to enhance your kitchen, bathroom, or even add a man cave to your home, visit aqua-tech.ca to learn more about their whole home renovations, including financing options. And uh, long overdue for me, I will be seeing the good folks at Modern Man a little later on today. Uh, of course, they were a big supporter of ours and helped us put us over the top of $5,000 for our Movember campaign, which we did in conjunction with Modern Man. And uh, hey, for fellas in Winnipeg, when you're looking for haircuts, beard shaping, shaves, color services, and more, 
only one place to go, or eight of them actually, because there's eight locations in Winnipeg, including the new location on Pemina Highway and Plessy Road. Book your look and make an appointment via modernmanbarber.com and give them a follow on Instagram as well, at Modern Man Barber Shops. All right, let's bring in the Ren Dog here. Fun K&R last night after a big win. Rennie, let's get to the important thing. Has anyone ever ripped one in a scrum that you've been at after a game? Um, I'm trying to think. I, I think there was, I think what, I think we poured through scrums before where you th- like you think that you hear a fart in the background. Wasn't there the didn't Tiger Woods get caught on camera doing it at a golf event or something <laughs> like that as well? But uh, boy, the cameras, uh, you got to think when the cameras are going, the audio is going as well. So if you happen to be one of those people who can't hold it, try and make sure it's silent, but violent <laughs> rather than blaring it out. <laughs> Well said. Well said, Sean. Um, a big way to end the uh, the roadie last night. I mean, there's a lot to get to from the game. Um, but, man, was that a big performance for Lauren Brassois. I know Kenny did a bit of a victory lap and was pr- giving premature wake-ups last night at the beginning of the show. But let's face yeah. it, considering how the season had gone for LB so far this year, especially that last game in Nashville, I thought that this was a crucial game for him you know, to have his confidence back. I mean, whatever about what the fans think, their confidence is not going to change the way the team plays, but also within the room. And uh, man, did he step up and show up and look pretty damn good doing it in that sweet retro kit. Yeah, I, I don't know that anyone had on their bingo card uh, Lauren Brassois stealing the game for the Winnipeg Jets yesterday. That's exactly what he did, though. That could, could have been, I mean, it could have got ugly. But if two or three of those go in, which they very well, well could have, and the Jets found themselves down three early on, that's not an easy team to push a comeback against. And and the risks that you would have to take to do it would probably open you up to, you know, high score, high danger scoring chances going the other way. That first goal was crucial so not allowing them to score and get up in that game I thought was absolutely huge and you're right like I don't think Lauren Brassois had looked anything anything like what we saw him look like with Vegas on that stretch that he made right at the end of the season that helped uh, propel the Vegas Golden Knights to the number one seed in the uh, in the Western Conference which was crucial for their Stanley Cup hopes uh, but also him out dueling Connor Hellebuck in the playoffs last year in their series against the Winnipeg Jets. That's the goalie the Jets thought that they were going to be getting. That's the goalie Huss probably that with the future uncertain at some point for Connor Hellebuck that the Jets thought may be, you know, uh, at least a, a one of a one two tandem here in Winnipeg if Connor Hellebuck was going to be moving on or potentially the Jets starting goaltender. I think, and we've had conversations about it. Uh, Lauren Brassois this season has turned out a lot different than he thought it may have. And I wonder how much of what we've seen from him so far is him struggling with the idea that he thought he was going to play more and now being thrust into a backup role again. And being a backup and being a backup to a goaltender like Connor Hellwick are two very different things because Connor chews up so much of the game time. There's not a lot left over. We were waiting to see if uh, Lauren Brassois could find a way to find his A game with the limited ice time that he was given. Um, he no doubt did it in that game yesterday, again, stealing one for the Winnipeg Jets. And I think it makes it interesting going forward how the Winnipeg Jets coaching staff, uh, if he if he can have another game like this and another game like this, how they decide uh, to handle this going forward. Because I do think at this stage and from what we've seen in the past, if you've got a goaltender that's proving they deserve more of the crease, I know Connor Hellebuck isn't the kind of goalie who wants to give up that time, but I think it's incumbent on the uh, the coaching staff to explore that uh, that possibility or that opportunity if uh, if um, that ice time is being earned by Lauren Brissett. Well, I mean, to be honest, I mean, I was thinking it might go the other way based on the way the season started, especially the groove that Hellebuck's in right now. And, hey, listen, yeah. he's the guy. They've committed to him long-term. I think everyone knows that more often than not in big games, 37 is going to be out there. But a game like that for LB, I think, not only states his case that don't worry, there's a couple games at the start, that's completely in the rear view. I can come out and I can be the number one star and I can be a guy you can rely on against good teams the way they did last night. And I think certainly for a coaching staff, I mean, Wade Flaherty works with these guys so closely and, 
goalies are a little bit of a different animal. But for Rick Bonus, that's calling the shots on who the guy is going to be in the net, um, I think it completely reinforces the reason why they brought him back, knowing what he can do. And, you know, going forward, I think it'll still probably be about 3-1 to one for Hellebuck. I mean, most likely, unless he needs some time off and doesn't play at the level, but that's certainly not happening right now. But just from a team perspective, to be able to take your Vesna Trophy goaltender, give him a night off against a top team in the other conference, and have your backup play like that, that's a very, very good development for the Winnipeg Jets. Well, I just like the idea of them having the option to explore what would happen were they to try and share the crease a little bit more. Because we know this. Lauren Bressois said at the beginning of the year, he's not here to be the backup. He wants to be the starter, right? And I think when you've got – I always think it's interesting when you bring in a backup goaltender. Uh, Jets have had backup goaltenders in the past where you asked them the question, like, are you here to push the starting goaltender? Um, and – a lot of times they've been like, no, like I'm just here to support the starting goaltender and, you know, get out of the way when I need to get out of the way, be there when I need to be there. Lauren Bressois came in, in a town where Connor Hellebuck was still around and said, I want to be the guy standing in the crease. I, I won the cup last year. I'm, that's not enough for me. I want to be the guy standing in the crease, raising my arms when the horn goes and we've won the Stanley Cup. That's what he wants. He's made no bones about it. Lauren Bressois is not here to be Connor Hellebuck's backup. Now, let's all be honest. Like Connor Hellebuck has earned the right to be a starting goaltender. He's one of the best goaltenders in the world. But one thing that we've seen, and I've said this time and time again, Connor Hellebuck has yet in my mind to prove that he's a playoff goaltender. He has not had his best performances in the playoffs. Uh, his best performances have been during the regular season, especially his very dominant performances. And part of that may have to do with the idea that he plays so much during the regular season. So if Lauren Bressois could keep posting games like that and let me be clear i think lauren bressois performance last night was the best performance by a winnipeg jets goaltender in a game this year so far i don't think connor hellebuck has a game that tops that game that we saw from lauren bressois i think that it would be incumbent upon the coaching staff to kind of explore the balance that has not produced in the playoffs in years past and maybe even Add that element of Lauren Bressois pushing and showing and proving down the stretch that he can be a starting goaltender and seeing Connor Hellebuck respond to the idea that he's being pushed by a goaltender that wants to take that crease from him. Because let's be honest, back in the days when uh, he was the starting goaltender for the Jets in the 2016-17 season and it didn't go well his first full season in the NHL, when the Jets went out and got Steve Mason to take over the crease, that's what brought out the Connor Hellebuck that we know today so we know in the past he has responded very well to being pushed so I would like the idea as a coach of taking Lauren Bressois if he keeps playing like that and not only using that as a tool to bring out the best in Lauren Bressois but to also bring out the best in Connor Hellebuck yeah well I mean listen I, I will argue that we've seen the best of Connor Hellebuck over the course of the last month or so I mean he has been awesome he didn't have a great first couple of weeks but since then and you look at every metric I believe he's number two now in the league and goals saved above expectation I mean he is he has been great. Um, but here's the thing. Like, though, like what you're talking about um, is, is a luxury for teams to have, especially oh, yeah. when you've got a number one like that. And you, we can't even go there until a performance like that for LB. And, you know, like I, I had thought that maybe early in the season, after the start that Hellebuck had, they might maybe skip an LB start and really get him rolling, specifically that Nashville game. They didn't, and LB didn't have a great game. This, yeah. I think, erases all of that. But, you know, what's most important is stacking up the points, Sean, because, and I get the argument that, you know, Hellebuck maybe played too much. I, I don't know whether, the, I'll be honest, I don't really think that the amount of games a guy's playing or an extra game in November is going to be impactful in April. But you know what is? Being in the situation the Jets found themselves in the in last season when all of a sudden they had to ride him the final 13 games of the regular season right. because they were playing for their playoff lives. And a big right. part of that was that Big Save Dave wasn't getting it done and they had frittered away the lead that they had. Um, the points right now, the points, putting yourself in the standings, give yourselves the luxury on 
resting a Connor Hellebuck more. And I'll tell you what, LB plays the way he did last night, and it'll be an easy choice for coaches to uh, err on the side of caution when it comes to who they're playing, especially if they've got that cushion in the standings. No doubt. And, and and to your point, I mean, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit surprised by this because when they've come into town and they've played, um, I don't take a look at teams like the Arizona Coyotes or the St. Louis Blues and think that they are the caliber of team that the Winnipeg Jets are. I look at their rosters right now and I say that. But to your point about getting the points, how important are these kind of things? Well, Right now, I believe, I, I, I looked at the standings this morning, if I remember them correctly, uh, the with the same amount of games played, the Arizona Coyotes are two points behind the Winnipeg Jets. They've played twice. Jets won both games. If if the script is the script is flipped and the Arizona Coyotes win one of those games, they're two points up on the Winnipeg Jets right now. If they win both those games, they're six points up on the Winnipeg Jets right now. Same deal with the St. Louis Blues, who the Jets have two wins over. If they win one of those two games that they lose to the Winnipeg Jets, they are now one point up on the Winnipeg Jets. That's how crucial it is to get these points. Uh, even last night, a game that the Winnipeg Jets steal, what does that mean? Uh, that that Lauren Brassois and went out and did what he did? Well, it means they're not tied in the standings today with the Arizona Coyotes. So I agree with you 100%. Um, just find a way to get it done. Uh, and, and I think for the most part, the Jets have done that this year. But the idea of like trying to find a way to balance that crease, it's it's always an interesting one. And, and while I will, I'll go to the first comments that you were making. I will say for the most part that like, okay, your goaltenders played 60, 62 games or whatever. I don't know how huge of an impact that's going to have on the playoffs, but I do wonder, Hustler, when it's been year after year after year after year, we know this, there's no goaltender who's been ridden more by their team over the last number of years than the Winnipeg Jets have ridden Connor Hellebuck. And so I'll say this, like, if you're the Winnipeg Jets, I don't think you're at the level that the Pittsburgh Penguins were for years, or the Tampa Bay Lightning, that like, basically what they're looking for, or even the Carolina Hurricanes, if you want to throw them in there, that like the regular season is almost like this testing ground to finally break through in the playoffs because that's where how you know or you know that you're going there. The Winnipeg Jets missed the playoffs two years ago. I, I still see them as that team that is usually a fairly safe playoff bet. What the Winnipeg Jets have been trying to do season after season is find different ways to break through in the playoffs and – I don't know. I think if you're not exploring the idea of saying Connor Hellebuck has been good, but we think he could be better, how could he be better? Well, let's explore ideas of seeing what we could do to put him in a position to be better. And if this is one of those things, I think it's incumbent upon a coaching staff to at least question if a better balance could be something that would pay off more in the playoffs. You know, it is, uh, it, it's funny you just mentioned the Coyotes and the Blues. Because both of those teams have been playing very well as of late. I mean, yeah, St. Louis is yeah. five and five in their last ten, but before that had rattled off, I think, about five wins in a row to really get right back in it. And you are correct. I mean, the Coyotes are just two points back of the Jets. The Jets are two points back of the Avalanche for first place and have a game right. with the Avs right now. Like, I'll be honest, I did not see the central division. Oh. looking significantly stronger than the Pacific division once you get past the top three. And I mean, right now, both of those teams are comfortably in the wild card spots right now. And yes. as I say, that wasn't the way I saw things, but I mean, credit to St. Louis turning it around after a pretty rough start. And the Coyotes, like they have a lot of talent on that club and they're feeling it right now. We mentioned at the start, five straight wins over the last five Stanley Cup champions in a row. First time it's ever been done in NHL history. And uh, the Coyotes are slowly but surely making some people notice them, even if they play in a junior hockey bar. Yeah, well, and here's the deal. I think I I think I said this on, on our Kenny and Rennie after that game. It was a it was a yeah. I think it was a hockey night in Canada game. I did the broadcast. Um, I think it was with Singer who made the call last night, and Sammy Cosentino who was play by play last night. And we were again talking about it kind of during one of the commercial breaks about the Arizona Coyotes because we're remarking on what they were doing. And I think what we had said was you know they didn't seem to be playing their best hockey at that time. But yeah, an extremely dangerous team and the, here's the interesting part about all this is maybe just don't look now but maybe just maybe the minnesota wild have found their feet underneath them the wild stumbled out of the gates last season and then spent the last 
part of the season, pushing and almost getting to a point where they won the Central Division. And within the last couple of games of the year, they were there pushing to maybe take that spot. They're a capable team. Uh, and then on top of that, we all know what the, the Edmonton Oilers are doing and they're turning things around. So this is, I like this. Hus, because last season it was basically like there were eight teams, sorry, seven teams in the West that were really good hockey clubs, and then three teams in the Winnipeg Jets by the end of the season, and the Calgary Flames, and uh, you know by the end of it, the the uh, National Predators fought their way into it. But Nashville had been like not a very good team earlier in the season, made a late push and made it interesting. Calgary just could not figure themselves out, and the Winnipeg Jets were dropping like a stone. But really, there was three teams battling for for uh, one last spot, and they were like, kind of, you take it. No, you take it. No, I don't want to go to the playoffs. Here you have it. It was almost like a battle of the least incompetent at that stage of the season. And I don't know, backing into the playoffs like that is... I, I don't like that. I like what we're seeing from the West this year because we've got the Coyotes saying, we're going to put our best foot forward. The St. Louis Blues are doing it too. The Minnesota Wild are doing it too. The Edmonton Oilers are turning things on and they're coming around as well. So I love the idea of a true fight for a playoff spot. I thought it was kind of, I don't know, it just, it just doesn't show well that there's eight teams and then there's a bunch of have-nots. The league is better with parity. And right now, surprisingly to a lot of people, include me in there, I didn't see the St. Louis Blues pushing the way that they have been this year. I didn't see the Arizona Coyotes pushing the way they have this year. So back to the point that you were making originally, the Winnipeg Jets have to be a team where yesterday, hey, you take the points and you'd be happy that you get the points even if you may not have been the better team in that game because right now, points matter because like you'd said you're two points out of first place you're just a couple points out of falling below the playoff line though and it's uh that it's fun watching hockey where every single game you play every night matters that you head out you know uh you know you mentioned the wild and i'll throw edmonton in this as well i mean the oilers have been off since the jets played them uh last thursday they're back at it tonight um both and the wild of course were in europe um, and both of those teams have fired their coaches. They are at 22 games played. So they do have two games to make up um, the wild on pretty much everybody else in the central, except for Dallas at 23 and Chicago. And right. the uh, the Oilers, um, the Kings have only played 21 games, but they're 14, 4, and 3. I mean, they are looking like a powerhouse right now. Oh, yeah. Those yes. teams, but and this just goes to show, Sean, just how hard it is to make up ground when you have to pass multiple teams. Right. Um, you know, the Oilers were three points out of the wild card spot after the game in, in Winnipeg. Uh, they didn't play for five days, and now they are... Eight points out. Eight points out. So, yeah. I mean, it is uh, white knuckle time right now for Minnesota and Edmonton. Um, and that's not changing anytime soon. The only thing that'll change if they go on a losing streak and essentially play themselves out of even an opportunity to come back into it. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the, 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 what what that can do, if you think about it, the, the Edmonton Oilers last year were comfortably in a playoff spot. Then they had their midseason dip kind of around the same time as Vegas did, around the same time as uh, the Winnipeg Jets did. The difference is they got out of it a lot earlier than the Winnipeg Jets did um, and went on a tear and almost got to the point where they were challenging Vegas uh, for first place in the conference. Um, if you remember at one point of the season last year, Calgary, who just never seemed to figure things out, the, the Oilers had dropped below them. So I, I do think it's a little bit of a superpower to be in that. Like right now, to your point, games matter in December to the Edmonton Oilers and to the Minnesota Wild in a way that they don't to those other teams that are further above them. So they're in the pressure cooker now. And you can look at that two ways. Like if they if they survive the pressure cooker and get to the playoffs, maybe that means they're more battle tested and they're ready to go maybe it means they've tired themselves out by that point that's another way to look at it as well but to your point those two teams as good as the Oilers have been playing and I think we saw a good representation of what they look like again and how dangerous they are against the Winnipeg Jets uh, in that last game that they beat the Jets three to one 
all that, you can't rest on that. I think they'd won five straight games or something like that. Congratulations. You're eight points out of the playoffs and you still have no room for error for a little while. Um, the, the point that we're talking about, uh, how good those teams like Arizona and St. Louis are, they're the teams that are really, really keeping um, the Jets honest right now. But if, you know, if you're eight points back of St. Louis, that means that you're 11 points back of the Winnipeg Jets. That's a lot of ground to make up. It's the Jets have put themselves in a place where you can't say you can't worry about those teams, but they're they're pretty far in the rear view mirror. It's hard to make up that kind of ground as long as the Jets keep playing the honest game that they are. Uh, but I just think, again, it just means that what we're going to see here is pressure, even on a team like the Winnipeg Jets, from this point of the season. Like the push to make the playoffs starts now for all these teams because it's not like last year where there's haves and have nots. There's haves that put themselves in a bad spot but still are able and capable we've seen in the past to push themselves back into the playoffs uh and there's halves now that we did not expect to see here and are playing really good games i'll say this again about the the arizona coyotes it's not a mirage they don't have the kind of roster that a lot of the competing teams do uh in in the west but what they do have is a really tough game style that they play like the Winnipeg Jets do. I've said this before. The Jets, as long as they stick to the Rick Bonus system, put themselves in a situation where they can win games every single night. Last night was one of them. They make it hard to get to that home plate area. So it puts you in a position where you can win every game that you play as long as you play the system. Some you win, some you lose. But the bet becomes, I think our goaltender can steal more games often than not. I think our skill can win us more games often than not, like they did last year. The Arizona Coyotes don't have that level of goaltending. They don't have that level of skill. But they've been playing that style of game that gives them an opportunity to win every single night and as long as they keep playing like that they'll be a very very tough out a tough team to knock out of a playoff spot you know it's so funny you mentioned the goaltending um we all remember Vimelka standing on his head and you know yeah. uh, giving the Jets fits and the same thing isn't it crazy Leafs. how that burnt into the brains of uh, Winnipeg absolutely Jets fans well trust me game. I'm a guy that jumped on him on my fantasy hockey league and I just pulled up the Coyotes goaltending stats this year and again we're talking yeah. about the first 25 games of the season but Vimelka has he's got an 892, a 345, he's two six and two. Connor Ingram is eleven and three with a two twenty-three goals against average and a nine thirty save percentage. And Andre Turin yeah. is just rolling him out night yeah. after night. Hey, listen, before we go, um, just back to the Jets for a minute. I wanted to ask you about the top line of Shifley and Connor now playing mm. with Nikolai Ehlers. Um yeah. Man, they look great last night, and you can see when those guys are feeling it, and and maybe they just need to play together more to get more of that. Like I wasn't sure whether that was going to be long for Ehlers to be up with those guys. We'd seen it tried before. We saw how well he played with Cole Perfetti and the production that they had. In your opinion, Sean, um, are they uh, are they getting better and more comfortable with each other each game? And um, do you expect that line combination to stick for the foreseeable future? Uh, for the foreseeable future, I don't know if it's the line that they end up landing on it. It becomes the new version of Mark Shifley, uh, Blake Wheeler, and Kyle Connor. Um, I've thought this was a, an interesting experiment to go at. Nick Ehlers seems to be one of those guys that we know that the, the analytics community, we know a lot of Jets fans have been begging for him to be given more opportunities like this in the past. I would I would think that maybe just maybe he was a player that he can be hard to read off, right? Because he gets going and he's so fast, he gets up ahead of the play, and I think there's sometimes that that um, you know other players are thinking he's not where I would want a guy to be. I need a guy to be here so I can move the puck. But the one thing about his speed is it puts opposition on their heels, and I think what we're seeing that we didn't see right off the bat with this line, but it's growing game after game, is Mark Shifley, who is a stupidly, stupidly cerebral player, right? Like just a, one of these guys that sees the game away the, the way almost no other player can see it in his ability to find guys, in his ability to just like in a heartbeat look assess the ice, find out where the, the dangerous is and, and get that to the player who's most dangerous. 
I think what we're seeing now is is uh, after a little bit of reps with each other, Mark Shifley finding a way to kind of get into the space that is created by that player. And what we're seeing is Nikolai Ehlers, because we sure saw it on that goal last night, being able to now not just like flying around, but find that space in the dangerous area for a guy like Mark Shifley to find him. Um, we know that the to that speed as a tool, especially when you've got the ability of Kyle Connor, who's always able to really push the puck down the ice, be really fast, but also kind of hide in the weeds and get to the right spot and be found like Mark Shifley. What you've got now is Mark Shifley, who I truly believe is one of the premier setup men in the game now, when you've got a winger that is each able to create speed and put opposition on their toes and then have another guy or but have those same wingers both be able to kind of hide in the weeds and slow play the game. It just gives so many options to Mark Shifley. I think we're seeing Mark Shifley right now. Again, one of the premier guys in the game playing some of the best hockey he's played for a long time. And with those two options, it really, really gets hard to, to, to slow them down because you've got so much speed, but so much hockey smarts there and so much ability by those two guys to get to the dangerous areas of the ice and be there without the opposition knowing that they're there. The only guy on the ice who knows he's there is Mark Shifley. Um, it's a dangerous, potent combo, uh, and I think it's hard to stop. Uh, you can't game plan against what that line has. Randog, great chat as always. Uh, had uh, last listening to you guys. It's always fun after the big wins. I know the KNR chat was lit last night. Everyone fired up. And actually, we'll be that tomorrow if you're able to. Pop by and join us for a couple of little brown jug and have a good time as we uh, raise some money for the cheer board tomorrow night Excellent. and uh, get ready for the holidays. Have a great Excellent. one, pal. Thanks for doing this as always. Anytime. Thanks for having me on, bud. Right on. And speaking of the party tomorrow, uh, I'm seeing in the chat, I believe Remus is bringing... NHL 94 and I'm hoping that that bubble hockey game is going to be there as well. So there could be there could be some big time rivalry matches tomorrow with everyone coming. By the way, if you jumped in late, it's going to be a great time tomorrow night in support of Christmas cheer board, little brown jug, every cent of the tickets and a raffle we're doing is going to be going to the cheer board. So if you haven't already grabbed your tickets, please do today. The link is in the description of this video. And if you're listening on the podcast, just get over to Winnipeg sports, talk.com 1198, all for a very important charity at this time of year. And uh, Boston Pizza's bringing pizza. Nick's bringing ice cream from DQ. Um, and we've got some great stuff. I think I mentioned this off the top, but I just went by, picked up a framed, autographed Kyle Connor photo, an autographed Kyle Connor puck, a Jets hoodie. We've got a great little brown jug package we'll be uh, putting into the raffle as well and working on a couple more things. So uh, let's see you tomorrow at LBJ for the WST holiday party. Um, listen, just before we bring in Mike... I got to give a big thanks to uh, our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market Gang. I know Men's Health Month is over, but we should be focusing on men's health 12 months a year. Um, and the best place to get great prices on natural and organic supplements to help you, as well as beauty products and groceries, is of course Vita Health Fresh Market with six locations in Winnipeg and online at myvita.ca. Um, congratulations again to Joe and the Trevor Linden jersey and the full pack of Prairie Naturals uh, supplements. Uh, you can pick up Canada's number one line of men's health supplements at any of the Vita Health stores, uh, as well as online with local delivery options at myvita.ca. Uh, big thanks to the gang at Wallace and Wallace. I mean, you all know Wallace and Wallace are the fencing experts in town. Did you know they're also the experts in overhead garage doors? Um, you know, a family-owned business since 1946 in Winnipeg and the leaders in both. And, you know, we are getting into winter as much as it's quite pleasant out right now. Your overhead garage door had lots of ups and downs this summer and fall, but it's about to work a whole lot harder this winter uh, because the cold puts much more stress on a garage door. The right time to prevent downtime this winter is now. Call Wallace & Wallace to book your inspection and maintenance service call today for residential and commercial overhead door sales and service. There's only one name or two you need to know, and that is Wallace and & Wallace. And speaking of the holidays, um, you know, a lot of you are going out to, you know, uh, 
company parties, Christmas parties and whatnot. I have a feeling there's probably a few of you that went into the closet going, man, I'm overdue to uh, maybe up my menswear game. Well, you know who can help you out with that? Andrew, Alex, and the great staff down at F Apparel. Shout out to my pal Mo, who's coming tomorrow night. He was just getting suited up with uh, something to wear for his big wedding day coming up in February. Um, no better place to do it than F Apparel. Custom suits beginning at 400 bucks, along with chinos, golf pants, custom shirts, both tucked and untucked styles, and an incredible selection of menswear accessories. If you are getting married, by the way, 15% discount when the wedding party gets their suits from F Apparel. And don't forget, uh, F gift cards might make a great gift for uh, the males in your circle. Pop down and see them, 190 Smith Street downtown and make an appointment and find out more online at F, that's E-P-H, apparel.com. All right, before he hits the road with the Winnipeg Jets, let's bring in Mike McIntyre, the Winnipeg Free Press. Mike, what's going on? Hey, Huss. <clears throat> Things are well. Good to be here as always. Uh, you know, it's only been a week since we did our last hit. The Jets played four games. The Jets played an entire homestand since we last uh, spoke. This one was... Uh, was fairly condensed Tuesday, Thursday, uh, Saturday, Monday. So four games in seven days, um, two and two. Uh, I guess it finished a lot better than it started. Uh, started with the two losses, finished with the two wins. And yeah, really interesting road trip coming up here. Curious to see uh, the Colorado Avalanche for the first time this season up close. And then, of course, the California swing. Um We'll see what the Jets can do. But uh, all in all, a pretty productive homestand for the team. Uh, and I'm sure we'll get into this, but was there anybody that needed a good performance more than Lauren Brassois? I When I tweeted yesterday morning at the morning skate that Lauren Brassois was going to be, uh, that we, he was in the starter's net, my Twitter feed was aflame with... Uh, well, let's just say a lot of folks didn't agree with the decision. They didn't understand the decision. Um, and they certainly weren't predicting what would ultimately play out last night at the rink uh, with Lauren Brassois kind of channeling that goaltender that the Vegas Golden Knights and their fans saw down the stretch last season. And a very welcome development for Lauren Brassois. And dare I say a welcome development for Connor Hellebuck because... The plan, of course, is to try and get Connor Hellebuck a little more rest this year than maybe he's had in, in previous years. Well, that plan kind of goes to hell if the guy that you brought in to be his understudy is not performing. And, you know, if push comes to shove and the Jets need wins and points, they're going to lean on Connor Hellebuck even more if the guy below him is not performing. So uh, I dare say that not only was it a... Uh, a breath of, of relief for Lauren Brassois. It probably was a sigh of relief for Connor Hellebuck and the whole organization as well. No, you know what? I'm uh, I, I'm with you. And and listen, I'm one of those people that was wondering what we were going to get from LB. Um, and listen, I said a number of times on this show that I would have given Hellebuck that start in Nashville. I thought that he was just really getting into his groove after sort of a so-so start to the season. <laughs> Um, and every one of these points is important. And if you stack the points right now, you give yourself the opportunity maybe to give your number one a little more rest later in the season, which did not happen with the Jets as he had to play the last 13 games. They were clinging to, they were basically in the playoffs in March and right. playing that way going forward. But Mike, uh, you know, it, it's hard to talk about LB's season um, and the huge game last night, you know, how big that is for him personally for the team without talking about how things changed significantly since he signed with the Winnipeg Jets in the summer <laughs> and we dropped the puck on the season. I mean, I everyone, um, insider, everything that we heard was pointing to, at some point, Hellebuck was probably going to be on the move. And yeah. I think that's a big reason why Loren Brassois looked at this opportunity as a spot that, you know, he might be able to truly become and get the reps that he was hoping for as a starting goaltender in the NHL. All that changed on Thanksgiving when Hellebuck signed a seven-year extension. And I do have some time for, you know, maybe a tougher start for LB just because of how things went. I mean, I don't think anything was guaranteed to him by any stretch of the imagination, 
But when that happens and all of a sudden you're in a situation that maybe you didn't expect to be in, that can be tough. All that being said, though, he is a professional, and that was a professional performance last night uh, right out of the gate when the Jets were a little slow to come out with that earlier start last night. And the Canes shooting the puck from everywhere, and he got into that groove early on. And it's sort of a shame that he didn't get a shutout because no Carolina Hurricane beat him. It was Kicked in by Dylan DeMello was the one. Uh, but, man, big again in the final minutes of the third period. Overall, um, it couldn't have gone much better for the team and their goaltender. Yeah, you don't get many games, Huss, where you can say the Winnipeg Jets scored all three goals in a 2-1 victory. <laughs> um, and, you know, there, there were a couple other plays in the third period last night where the Jets nearly knocked pucks in or the pucks nearly banked in off Winnipeg Jets players. Like, uh, you know, Lorne Bressois, he was battling the opponent, but he was also battling his teammates uh, at times, just some some puck luck around the net. Um, yeah, I think, you know, you've, you've hit the nail on the head when it comes to opportunity, a door that he probably thought was wide open when he elected to sign here, you know, to potentially serve one year or part of one year as Connor Hellebuck's understudy again. But, you know, as early as maybe the trade deadline, heck, as early as training camp, um, he might have thought that that the number one job was there for the taking. Well, clearly, with Connor Hellebuck re-upping long-term, the number one job is now spoken for for this season and for seasons to come. And for that reason, I suspect the door is probably closed on Lauren Brassois, you know, being here maybe beyond this season. He, he just signed the one-year deal. That being said, um, it would obviously benefit Lauren Brassois regardless. He, he still believes he can be a number one. Um, I doubt he believes that it's going to happen with the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, but there's 31 other teams out there. And so, you know, Lauren Brassois, uh, it would be in his best interest, obviously, to have a great season. Um, but he didn't get off to a great start. Now, he only played five of the first 23 games, and I got to think, us like, don't forget, he's coming off, you know, a significant surgery. Um, he got hurt in the second round of the playoffs against Edmonton last year, and if he doesn't get hurt, there's a chance that, you know, he would have been where Aiden Hill was, which was raising the, the trophy as the guy that continued to play, and perhaps he got the, he would have got the Aiden Hill extension the big money term in vegas that hill got um but obviously the injury derailed that and maybe the injury in a way and not playing a whole lot here to start the year um you know maybe that contributed to a slow start as well it was interesting that he said and he's not the first goalie to say this he likes uh heavy shot volume games we know connor hellebuck does too and my goodness huss he's got enough of them over his jets career um, uh, you know, because of the way they played defensively in the past. Yesterday was a bit of an anomaly in terms of this year's Jets team to see them give up so many shots. But perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that's the way Carolina plays. Not unlike the Florida Panthers, a, a real shot volume team. They try and create a lot of chaos, uh, throwing pucks at the net, you know, rebounds, deflections. And in, in the case of their one goal, it worked. Uh, but credit to Lauren Brassois, he stepped up at a time when both he and the team needed it. And I got to think, you know, he, he was going to start one of the games on this road trip coming up. I suspect it's the back half, um, probably the tougher half of that back-to-back -back in Los Angeles uh, next week. Because um, usually you start your number one guy on the front end and play your back up on the back end. I, I wasn't sure that that would have taken place, Mike, but... I also kind of thought that they'd put LB in against Chicago, even though Hellebuck yeah. is Mr. Matinee and have your number one for a tough test like the Carolina Hurricanes. And I think with the way he played last night, it's quite clear that they're going to set out this schedule and they are going to stick to it. Um, and whether it's San Jose or whether it's L.A., LB is going to be looking to kind of build off that performance, uh, that performance last night. In front of the goaltenders, there were seven defensemen last night, and yeah. Nate Schmidt wasn't one of them. Um, and I'm going to say this right off the bat. Like, I know people are all over Nate. You know, he's playing third pairing minutes. He's making $6 million. 
I mean, there is certainly an inefficiency when it comes to his contract. But if you take away all of the numbers, he and Dylan Sandberg have been very solid this year. Like, I, I don't know, maybe you disagree. I don't think Schmidt did anything to get himself pulled out of the lineup. It's just that you've got these guys with the team. At some point, you have to get them in. Um, what do you make of that battle for the sixth spot? I'm not sure how often we'll see seven defensemen play and how have Declan Chisholm in his last two games and Logan Stanley in yesterday's game done to maybe help their cause as being more in the mix for regular playing time. Yeah, and I agree with you, Haas. I don't think it's anything that Nate Schmidt has done, you know, egregious that that has taken him out of the lineup. Perhaps to a degree, it's what Nate Schmidt hasn't done and I'm talking specifically about, you know, point production and, and some offense. Now, it's a little unfair to kind of lump the power play struggles on Nate Schmidt, of all people. Huh. He's on the second unit, which often only gets out for the last 30, 40 seconds if they're lucky. If that. If that. And a lot of times, of course, the the first unit is changing when the puck's been dumped back into Winnipeg's end. So now... The second unit comes out and then they got to regroup and and make the zone entry and they're lucky if they can really get set up. Um, but uh, five on five, you know, Nate Schmidt, his, his total production through his 20 games is one assist. And, you know, Declan Chisholm took two and a half periods to match Nate Smith's offensive production over 20 games. Um, now, that's a bit unfair to just boil it down to that. But I think Declan Chisholm, the way he played against Chicago, and granted the Blackhawks are not a juggernaut, but he looked really smooth. And I think he absolutely earned himself another look. And in fact, Haas, it would have been, I think it would have been the wrong message on a lot of levels if you just yanked Declan Chisholm back out after a really solid game against Chicago um, uh, you know, a game that snapped a three-game losing streak and now sat him out again. I, I just think that wouldn't have that wouldn't have been a good message to the player. It wouldn't have been a good message to the whole team. So he stays in. I guess where the big surprise was yesterday is to hear that they then decided to go 7D and Nate Schmidt still wasn't one of them. Uh, and I suppose part of that goes back to Rick Bonus, who's you know stated on a few occasions he doesn't want guys to sit too long. So was that a one and done? But even if it's one and done on 11 and seven, again, has Declan Chisholm now, you know, made the Jets reconsider just keeping him in for the time being? And I think the answer is yes, or at least it should be. Um, and so Nate Schmidt's return may have to wait here a bit. I'm, I'm not confident enough to say that he's now officially number eight on the depth chart when it comes to healthy defensemen. Um, but it's clear, Huss, he's certainly not the clear-cut number six either um, because of Chisholm's play. And, of course, this whole situation could get a whole lot messier in the not-too-distant future when a guy that, had he not broken his ankle in that final preseason game against Ottawa, I, I think would have been number six and pushed Nate Schmidt down the depth chart in Billy Hainala, Um he, you know, he took a bit of a twirl today down at uh, at the Iceplex. Um, Rick Bonus said that he's not necessarily ahead of schedule. They, they're still looking at the two to three month range, um, you know, which could take him potentially to the end of December, beginning of January. There might be a conditioning stint with the moose worked in there, given the nature of the injury. But if the Jets continue to remain healthy, and that's the other thing that, you know, you almost don't want to, you don't want to jinx the team, if you will, but they've been remarkably healthy on the blue line. They've had some injuries, of course, but they're all up front. Um, you know, Gabe Velarde, obviously, and and Vlad Nemesikov and Rasmus Kapari, a um, few other guys banged up. Uh, but on the blue line, everybody so far has remained healthy. And, you know, part of that is probably some good fortune. You look at the Jets, they've become, I mean, they're not the Vegas Golden Knights in terms of shot blocking. But I think there's been a real commitment to getting into shooting lanes and 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 you know paying the price, if you will. Well, so far the Jets have been fortunate that no price has been paid in terms of 
of any games lost to injury by defensemen who we've seen some guys, you know, hobble off the ice after particularly painful shot blocks. So far, so good in terms of the injury front. Well, and then Slamberg's been a huge part of that. I see T. Will has entered the chat. He said, uh, Schmidt looks really solid because the Jets have been protecting Slammy and Schmidt. If you put them out there more often, they would look a lot worse. Well, I don't think anyone's suggesting play them 25 minutes a game. I mean, that's your third, third pairing. I, I, I mean, listen, it was about a week and a half or two weeks ago, and I haven't checked it since. But, I mean, that pairing was number one in the NHL um, for pairings that have played more than 100 minutes, and they had just about 140 um, with only two goals against in the entire season. So they have had good results. And I guess this goes back to the conversation about competition to be in the lineup. Um and the fact that they haven't had any injuries outside of Vili Hanela. Mike, uh, this is going to be very difficult, I think, for many people in the organization. Because they, I've heard this from Craig Heisinger back in the Moose days. If you want to win a championship, you need to be 10 deep on your blue line. And while a Logan Stanley is not probably even in the top eight, in my opinion, when all those guys are there, there's a chance you might need them at some point. Well, and the goal now for the Jets is going to be how do we manage this moving forward if they're feeling pretty good about the blue line? Now, would they love to add a more impact player for the top four for sure? And I think that's probably going to be number one on Kevin Chevalier's list wish list. But that's at the deadline. Like, let's assume that Vili goes down to the moose, plays really well, is back, is ready to go, and they want to put him in the lineup. I mean, do you see that? Do you see them making a move? Or is this going to be, hey, this is a good problem to have. Let's let these guys battle it out. Play the guy that's hot right now. If you have to have Philly play a little bit more in the American Hockey League, you do it. Um, because you don't want to lose one of those players that probably would, I mean, with the exception of Nate Schmidt, because just because of his contract, um, you might have to, you know, take a chance, whether it was, I don't think it'll be Declan Chisholm, but potentially Logan Stanley, who I think is still a guy that they look at that, you know, if they needed him yes. late in the season or in the playoffs, he is a guy that could go in and um, play some minutes in a sixth man role. Yeah, and I, I agree on that number of, you know, probably 10 deep. And I think the Jets, if you look at what they have right now, you know, they have uh, eight healthy defenseman on the roster um, when you include Nate Schmidt, uh, the healthy scratch last night who didn't play along with the seven who did. Then you got Billy Hainala, you know, working his way back from injury. And then I would extend that to say a guy like Kyle Capobianco who did pass through waivers uh, out of training camp pass and now is anchoring the blue line uh, for the moose. Um, he's close to a point a game pace. I think he's second on the moose in scoring. And he's a guy that we saw, you know, in limited action last year, come in and, and provide some capable defense. So you obviously hope you don't run into a point where you need to dip into your ninth or 10th guys, but reality says you probably will at some point. Um, but yeah, I think the waiver situation is what makes this a little more complicated because as you say, you'd, you'd want to kind of keep all your guys as sharp as possible the problem for the Jets is Stanley and Chisholm both would require waivers to go down, and there's certainly a belief that neither would clear uh, if they were to go on the waiver wire, and the Jets would have a Johnny Kovacevic situation all over again where you lose an asset for nothing. And so that's where we now get into Vili Hainala, who doesn't need waivers. And that was the whole discussion in training camp, right? Does that ultimately work against him? I think we saw with his play he seemed to be on the verge of earning a roster spot based on his strong camp. Does the situation now change if they've seen, you know, Chisholm and Stanley in limited work and feel like, you know what, we're happy to give those guys some games here at the NHL level and we don't want to risk losing them on waivers. Does Billy Hainala essentially get penalized for his untimely injury and does a conditioning stint to the Moose maybe extend a little longer uh, because of his waiver status and because they have healthy bodies up here holding down spots? I don't know the answer to that. That's going to play out. And as you say, I, I would expect the Jets would be looking at the blue line market as we get closer to the trade deadline, particularly 
a right shot defenseman, uh, perhaps to add to this roster. Because, as you say, they envision themselves going on a bit of a run here. And I don't think the Jets want to get into a situation where uh, they feel like they're running out of healthy, capable bodies on the back end. Is there a scenario you could see where Nate Schmidt actually gets waived? And, and listen, he's a great teammate. They love the guy. He is bit, listen, as I said, I mean, I don't think you can really complain about what he's brought to the table so far this year, other than not much offensive production. But right. they do want to give these younger players the opportunity to play. And to your point, I think if Declan looks like he has a comfortable, I mean, they want to keep him in the lineup. The reason why I say Nate Schmidt is not because he hasn't acquitted himself well when he's been out there playing with Dylan Sandberg is the fact that there, in my opinion, is zero chance he would get claimed. Yes. Um, and then he would still be there with the organization. He'd still be able to be added. I mean, he is a veteran player, and I'm not sure. Does he have a no move? Well, but is I think that, that yeah, and I, I don't think that still prohibits you from sending a guy down to the way, uh, down to the minors, right? I, I don't, I believe that every player is eligible to be waived, Huss. I could be wrong on that, but even if there's a no move, um, I mean, he still gets his NHL full salary, right? So there's no issue there. Um, yeah, it's it's a modified no trade, so it's not a no move. So I, don't I, think, I don't know you can't move no move guys to the uh, to the minors. So to, to answer your question, absolutely. And I, I was thinking of that actually yesterday when, again, I think it was a bit of an, uh, uh, an interesting development that they had seven defensemen in the lineup and he wasn't one of them. And when you talk about potentially roster crunch and decisions, if he's going to just continue to be, you know, again, assuming everyone's healthy, a very expensive, healthy scratch, um, not so much for any kind of cap relief it would bring, but strictly for the opening that it would create on the 23-man roster. I could see a situation happening, Haas, at some point here where, you know, and, and to your point, exactly to your point, because while they fear Declan Chisholm or Logan Stanley would likely get lost on the waiver wire for nothing, I don't think there would be a fear uh, of Nate Schmidt. And, and to be perfectly honest and blunt if someone wanted to claim nate schmidt in some ways they'd be doing the jets a huge favor by clearing that money off the books which the jets would then suddenly have to kind of add to the kitty when it comes to uh shopping at the trade deadline uh, i think we all realize the jets have tried to move nate schmidt in the past if they could have moved on from that contract without paying a premium i think they would have um, they haven't to this point, and I don't think they would on the waiver wire. So, yes, uh, I do think that's something that, uh, you know, it would be a difficult conversation, no question. Um, but I go back to, you know, a few years ago, and uh, the Jets waived Matthew Perot. Uh, and that ended up just being a paper move. He didn't actually go down to the Moose. Um, that was at a camp. They were trying to do some salary uh, cap kind of um, gymnastics. Um but there was a risk they took that, that he could be lost. I don't think that risk is the same with Nate Schmidt. But, you know, Nate Schmidt is a, look, we all know he's a really positive guy. Um, you know, he, he, he's constantly upbeat, brings laughs to teammates. And I'm sure this is a, a very difficult thing that, that he's endured. Uh, Kenny Weeb sat down with him, I think, after his first healthy scratch earlier this year. And Nate Schmidt said all the right things. And I think he's being the great teammate that he is, I'm sure this is a really tough realization um, for Nate Schmidt that, you know, he certainly doesn't factor into the Jets' plans the way that, that he, he once did. Hey, listen, the check's still going to clear. And, uh, you know, and I think they all realize, especially someone like Schmidt, I think looking at this season long term knows that, you know, you may be in the lineup, you might not be in the lineup, but come playoff time, everyone's going to be there on the squad. It's all sure. hands on deck, and you see what happens. So, it, it, I mean, the bottom line is they're going to want to give Vili an opportunity at some point. Um, and it's just very crowded there with Declan Chisholm now getting an opportunity. And, I mean, what did you think of Stanley? Did he do anything to help his cause last night? I mean, I, I was uh, – he certainly can ice the puck with authority. I'll say that. Well, he didn't take a great penalty. Uh, the Jets had just gone up 2 nothing. He takes a cross-checking penalty. Um, 
And sure, you can debate the merits of if that's a good call or not. Put himself in a position, you know, to to take to 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 make the official make a decision. And the Jets killed that penalty off. But I mean, Hus, that's I'm sorry, that's a play. If you're Logan Stanley and your your status in this lineup is tenuous at best, I don't think you can you can be taking that kind of penalty. Um, you know, fortunately, the Jets. That for him, the Jets did kill it off. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, you're right. Uh, the, the, you know, we see Declan Chisholm, the way he can certainly exit the zone and, and how kind of calm, cool, and collected he does it. Logan Stanley uh, does not have some of those same characteristics when it comes to getting the puck out. A lot of stuff off the glass, as you say, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of icings. Um, so, I mean, he's a very different player, of course, Huss, but, uh, you know, I, I think he was fine. Obviously, the Jets gave up a little more than they'd like. But what, what I found really interesting, Huss, you look at the minutes um, yesterday. I just pull it up here. So, Logan Stanley played 12.58. I must admit, that's a lot more than I expected. Uh, for dressing seven defensemen. Oh, and you know what? If you had asked me just from watching the game to guess how much he was on the ice, I would have said it was like seven or eight minutes. That's that actually is quite surprising. Yeah, so he played he played twelve fifty eight. Declan Chisholm was ten oh eight, and Dylan Sandberg actually was twelve fifty seven. He actually won. So Logan Stanley played one second more than. Uh, and Dylan Sandberg. So they dressed seven defensemen. If you go by ice time yesterday, he actually had the fifth most, again, by one second over, over number six, Dylan Sandberg. Now, the Jets were shorthanded uh, three times yesterday, and he got 46 seconds of penalty kill time. But Hus, Dylan Sandberg had 322 on the PK. Uh, Declan Chisholm doesn't kill penalties, of course, but that means Logan Stanley. Got a lot more five-on-five five time yesterday than Dylan Sandberg, who, again, we talk about, you know, the pairing with Sandberg and Schmidt and how effective five-on-five five those guys have been. Well, Nate Schmidt's the healthy scratch. Dylan Sandberg's still in the lineup. And I'm not sure, you know, I would never tell Rick Bonus necessarily how to run his team. I don't think playing Logan Stanley, you know, three or four more minutes in a game than Dylan Sandberg at five on five is, is the sort of thing that should become a, a trend or a habit. Yeah. Agreed on that. Um, Mike, uh, just quickly before we go, uh, just quick thoughts on um, the deal that they did with uh, Nino Niederreiter yesterday, same money, $4 million, but being able to get it done on just a three-year term. Well, and I think that's key. There was certainly some talk and I might say fear that you know, four years would be, and then you're you're wondering, okay, what does that fourth year potentially look like? He's 31 now, so he'll be 32 when the deal starts. You go four years, now he's 36. Um, I think the money, you know, again, I, I saw lots of talk in the four to four and a half range, so they keep it right at four. Um, so there's there's no salary jump there uh, from what they're currently paying them to what they will for the next three years. And the fact they get him locked up at three years, and Hus, I think we all um, we all can appreciate what Nino Niederreiter has done on the ice, the way he plays. You know, I go back to that hat trick he scored in in Arizona a few weeks back, and Mason Appleton saying after the game that that the combined length of his three goals was like two and a half feet. Uh, that speaks to you know him getting to those dirty areas, the net front presence that the Jets don't maybe have enough of he's one of the guys that goes there he's a high character guy you know again I go back to last year and when he came out to answer the bell in Carolina after his line with Shifley and Connor got benched for half a period and Shifley and Connor did not want to speak to the media that day uh and you know Nina Ryder did and he said all the right things you know we're seeing he's he's doing charitable work in the community he's mentoring a young the hockey team, like he, he checks off all the boxes, and I think it's a great deal for the Jets, and it's a good deal for Nino Niederreiter, who had no real interest in 
being one of those players, Huss, in the twilight of his career, who, you know, is living on one-year deals and, you know, constantly changing scenery. For he sure. really likes Winnipeg. He likes what this city is. He loves what the organization is about. Um, it made sense to to get his name on an extension. And, yeah, I think it's a win-win for both sides. Big time. And I think he's going to be a great mentor as well, you know, in the second yeah. and third year of that deal when the McGroarties and Barlows are trying to cut their teeth in the National Hockey League. A Absolutely. great guy to have around them and learn. Mike, travel safely. Uh, we'll look forward to your reports from the road heading into a big tilt for first place on Thursday. Yeah, we will uh, – <laughs> we do this next week we'll uh we'll be in san jose uh so we'll we'll chat with you from uh, california next week love it thanks mike right. great stuff with mike mcintyre the winnipeg free press we're going to talk a little football on a big development in jacksonville in just a minute with dave naylor uh oh, before we bring in dave big news for the bombers which we'll touch on as well willie jefferson is back great news for bomber fans for one of the biggest and most important players on their defensive unit of course, our Bomber Reports are brought to you by Princess Auto, proud sponsors of the Blue and Gold, and the place where you'll find the best deals on the most unique assortment of tools and equipment around everything you need to complete the projects on your list or start something new is at Princess Auto. Pop by and see them just in time for the holidays on Panet Road or Portage Avenue West, and shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. Speaking of holiday shopping... Uh, Royal Sports is busy these days, and, well, it should be because it is literally the greatest sports superstore you'll find maybe anywhere with the biggest stock and selection um, around. Everything you need for the Jets fan in your family or in your circle is available at Royal Sports. All the new jerseys, thousands of pieces of Winnipeg Jets merchandise, hats, toques, scarves, you name it, they've got it. Not to mention a big bomber uh, bomber selection. NFL, Major League Baseball, NBA, and who knows, maybe we'll need some Otani Blue Jays jerseys coming up. We'll talk to Remus about that a little later on. Bottom line is get ready for the holidays and take care of your entire list at Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. Give them a follow on Instagram for the latest merchandise drops, sale information, and great holiday gift ideas. And do have to once again thank our friends at Boston Pizza. The great folks at BP are supporting our charitable event tomorrow night in support of the cheer board by uh, throwing some of those gourmet pizzas our way so we can mix a slice in with some of that great little brown jug brew that we'll be enjoying tomorrow night. Get your tickets if you haven't already. Link is in the description of this video or if you're on the podcast, go to winnipegsportstalk.com. Every cent going to the Christmas cheer board tomorrow night. We'll see you at 7 p.m. And a big thanks to BP. Uh, of course, we did the old rip over to BP after the game last night to check out the Monday Nighter. And we're going to get into that in a moment, whether it's the Jets. Well, Thursday night will be a great day to be at BP. And thank God we've got a Jets game because we don't have to go through Bailey Zappi and Mitch Trubisky going head-to-head -head in prime time. But that's where we are in this NFL season. Boston Pizza, pop by your local location. Of course, you can always order online at bostonpizza.com. All right, let's pivot to a little CFL and NFL talk with uh, TSN football insider Dave Naylor. Nails, what is going on? Great to have you back on the show and great to see you in the hammer a couple weeks ago. Yeah, man, it was a good, great cup. Good game, good week, good, you know, it just... It was. It just felt like it. It worked. You know, it was Southern Ontario Grey Cups are never a slam dunk like they are in the West. Although you know, I mean, Hamilton. What was their second one they'd had since 1996, and the other one in COVID was kind of tough to judge. So, but no, I thought, I thought that's that organization just uh, all around. I thought did a, a really fine job, and and what a great game we had. Yeah, you know, listen, I kind of want to dive into NFL stuff, but just uh, we're going to hear from Willie Jefferson, who inked mm -hmm. up yesterday. Just a quick thought on the Bombers. Uh, there was a lot of talk about how the management would look, never mind the team. But Kyle Walters is back, Gavaya's back, Danny Max back, and Buck Pierce, while flirting with the Saskatchewan Rough Riders for their head coach job, is back at OC. And now Willie Jefferson's the first domino to fall. What do you make of where the Bombers are right now, going into this crucial part of the off season? No, it's it's a you know it's a perfect storm sort of for to keep that band together because no one's hiring a GM. You know, like and that's and honestly, if they were. I think I think they're probably. I don't think you'd have all those guys together again. You know, it's a, it's a weird year where you have one head coach hire and no GM hires in the CFL. That doesn't happen very often. That the combination of GMs and coaches being hired across the league 
Well, we're going to find out another one in Hamilton now. So I guess that's two. I've just opened up and had coaches. But, uh, but you know, they've just done their organizational shuffle from within with Ed Hervey getting the GM title from assistant GM. So, yeah, it's, it's, I, I'm surprised just because, you know, it just seemed like for a long time to let your GM go an entire season without a contract while your head coach has two years remaining. Now, it's partially it's a function of the, the salary management cap, and everybody talked about that openly. And they managed to get everybody underneath it. And the question is going to be one of the bombers, I think, is, okay, they've kept the management team together. How much of the roster do they come together? How much is and, – and how do the philosophies change out? I mean, it's it's almost interesting at Grey Cup when you talk to Mike O'Shea and you talk to Kyle Walters. I mean, Mike admits to being the guy who's comfortable with veteran players and doesn't believe in the you're better to get rid of a guy too soon than too late theory, you know, that uh, coaches in football a lot of times espouse, right? Get rid of a guy early than late. And Mike, you know, when I actually – said that premise to him during a media availability at the Great Cup. He started shaking his head in the middle of my sentence. I guess by the way he thinks, you know, but GMs tend to think that way a little more. So I think it'll be interesting to see where the knife comes down on this roster. They can't keep everybody. Some of that is free agency, but at some point, some of that's going to have to be age just because of the, how long this band has been together. You just don't see it very often in a sport like football. And uh, I mean, they're two plays away from winning four Great Cups. So it's working for them, but you know, the clock is ticking as well. Well, it, uh, it's going to be a fascinating offseason. Now, we know who's calling the shots and running the show. Now we'll see uh, who's uh, on the field when um, we get to next year's CFL season. Uh, Nails, let's move south of the border. Um, wild Monday nighter last night, and I don't think a lot of people uh, were expecting that. Mm. Um, we'll get to Jake Browning in a minute, but let's face it, everybody north of the border saw Trevor Lawrence hobble down the uh, down the, the the hallway after being injured it's been reported as a high ankle sprain which guarantees a player missing time and every cfl fan is going what does this mean for nathan rourke well I'm, i mean i'm gonna go back to what i said nine months ago and i think it's absolutely sort of true today it's as true today as it was nine months ago and i'm not doing the i told you sort of thing but this is this is the scenario Okay, that Nathan Rourke was going to go to camp and no matter what he did at camp, he was going to come out as the number three guy, not the number two. That came to fruition. Doug Peterson was open. He said there is no competition for number two. CJ's our number two. Didn't matter what Nathan did. Okay, so he comes out of camp as the number three. How does Nathan Rourke get playing time? One, it takes a significant injury for Trevor Lawrence. We may have had that box ticked, if you will. Not that anybody's cheering for his injury, but in terms of scenarios that had to happen, I mean, let's make mistake, no mistake. If the Jacksonville Jaguars could have their way, Trevor Lawrence would take every snap until 2039. You yeah, know? He's the franchise. You know what I mean, it's like that, that, there's no agenda to get Nathan Rourke on the field. But so this is how it has to happen. He has to get injured for a significant amount of time. C.J. Beathard goes in and is ordinary or less than ordinary. And then they decide when to give Nathan an opportunity. And the question we posed last year was how much did Nathan Rourke's outstanding preseason for Jacksonville shorten that leash so that the amount of time that they would say, you know what, let's try Nathan Rourke. Did that, does that happen sooner than it would have if then, if he'd been ordinary in the preseason, just, you know, to remind everybody, he had nine drive opportunities in the preseason. He had touchdowns on five of them. He had three other drives. One ended on a first play fumble by a running back. The other two ended in victory formation at the end of the game. So in terms of opportunities he had to score a touchdown, nine of them, five touchdowns. Again, it's preseason football, but when you have rookie players in the NFL, that's all you can go on. All, all rookies are evaluated off of preseason. There's no, they don't have any game tape. Nathan works no different. So, so here we are at that stage. The, so what's it going to take? If, if C.J. Beather goes out and plays really badly could we see nathan rourke on sunday in cleveland uh, if he plays just okay and they lose a couple of games could we see nathan Rourke get a start after two weeks yeah, how much did he play how much of an impression did that make on the coaching staff and the one thing and david said sanchez said this on sports center this morning and last night was that the, in the difference of the, the players bethard has more experience no question but Nathan Rourke is more of a dynamic player. He's going to make more of those plays that can bring you out of your seat and that not everybody can make. And let's just be clear about the quality of the player that he's behind, okay? 
And I'm not, I am not pretending that I've evaluated C.J. Beathard in any sort of depth. I watched him play two preseason games last summer, one in Dallas, one in Detroit. In my opinion, and again, I'm not the expert on this, but other people who are more exported than me, we all agreed Nathan Rourke played him in the preseason. But here's C.J. Beathard's career as a National Football League quarterback. He has a completion percentage under 60%. He has 18 touchdown passes and 14 interceptions. Now, does that sound like a guy who would be impossible to unseat over a four-game stretch? No, it doesn't. And look, when you're playing behind a franchise quarterback like Trevor Lawrence, there's all kinds of long-term things that are that are built into the decision-making who's going to play, like the fact that they've got so much investment in him and they know what his high side is. And it didn't matter if he played four crappy games. You're not going to sit him down. But when you've now left with a combination – of C.J. Beathard and Nathan Rourke for, let's say, a month. Let's say it's five weeks. All you care about is getting as many W's as you can while, while Trevor Lawrence is out. You don't care about what it does to the dynamic of your team because once Trevor Lawrence comes back, he's the guy again, and none of it matters. So do I think there's a possibility that Nathan Rourke could play in the next month? Yes, I do. You know, the uh, the other part of it is that, I mean, that was a really tough loss for Jacksonville because, you know, very quietly, Gardner Minshew, speaking of backup quarterbacks, has rallied the Colts with four straight wins. C.J. Stroud and the Texans had a massive win over the Denver Broncos. Both of those teams are just one game behind the Jags right now. And, I mean, I'm looking at their schedule, Dave. Um, they go to Cleveland – and play the best defense in the league. Then they host the Ravens, who need to keep winning if they want to hold on to the number one, uh, number one seed. Those games are very much on the table for losses for Jacksonville. And then it does lighten up with Buccaneers, Panthers, and Titans. But again, there's a very real chance that Trevor Lawrence does not play in any of these games. So they got to find a way to get a few wins and make sure they're in the playoffs and part of that postseason party for when Lawrence presumably is able to get back in it. And this is all what builds into the decision that Doug Peterson has to make. You know, if C.J. Beathard goes out and gives them competent or better than competent play at quarterback and they're winning games, there's no decision to make. But if he's struggling, he's turning the ball over, they're not scoring points and they can't rally to come back in the second half, at what point does he say, Let's give a shot to the kid who showed us all the magic last summer. And that's why it was important. Everything that Nathan put down on tape was to leave that impression in the, in the minds of Doug Peterson and the coaching staff. Now, I can't tell you when that's going to happen. But the point, I think you make the point that you know, they really have the priority. they got to win games. they got to go with the guy that they think can win games for them. And right now, out of the shoot, that's going to be C.J. Beathard because he's earned that spot and he's the veteran. But as I say, look at his resume. Does that sound like a guy that – there's no way that he could be unseated. And, you know, again, I, I don't know what more Nathan Rourke could have done in the preseason. Um, you know, the fact that he ended up as the number three is no discredit to him because Peterson said there was no competition for the job, for the number two. But now there is going to be competition, I think, if not officially, unofficially, because Jacksonville needs to win games. And the AFC is so upside down, as you mentioned. I mean, you rattle off all those teams and, you know, I, I, I cover a Buffalo Bills team that's one week away from going to six and seven, which is unreal. But, yeah, it's another story. <laughs> well, and, and, and exactly. I mean, Bills at Arrowhead to take on a pissed off Chiefs team after losing to the Packers on La at Lambeau wow. on Sunday night. Um, and, and, you know, the Bills, uh, like at six and six, they're absolutely still in it. But it's about winning games right now. And I will say this, the 17th game going into week 18 um, this entire playoff scenario, in all likelihood, in both conferences, Dave, you know, could have three, four, five additional teams literally fully in the mix going right down to the final couple games of the regular season. Yeah, and just and I haven't done this scientifically, but looking at the standings, when you look at them, we just don't have the elite, elite records that we're used to seeing. And then we don't have the stinker <laughs> records that we're used to seeing. I mean, you've got Philadelphia with two losses. You've got New England with two wins, but you know pretty much everybody else. There's just there's I've never seen teams bunched so much in the middle, and I think that's just reflected of you. There's so many games you look at and say, well, that's a that's a that's an easy win or that's an easy game to predict, and then Sunday rolls around and sure enough, it's not. And I think Kansas City, well, Green Bay, two weeks in a row, 
you know, like, like that's, um, look, I, I wouldn't say it's the only reason, but when we, when we debated whether I was going to cover the, the Thanksgiving day game in Detroit this year, uh, part of our rationale was, well, it's the Packers, right? Like it's not a great game. Well, Packers went and won that game. Right. And then, uh, again, that was just part of what we talked about in the discussion. And then the Packers go the next week and knock off Kansas City. And the Packers, I might add, was a team that were sellers at the trade deadline. And with one more win, they're going to have a better record than the team to which they sold. The Bills. <laughs> it, it, is, uh, it, it is wild. And, um, and listen, yes, I'm a Chiefs fan. Yes, I'm still choked that they somehow just decided to not call one of the most blatant PIs that you'll ever see on MVS. But credit where credit is due, Dave. Jordan Love was awesome yeah. on uh, on Sunday night, and if they're going to get that sort of quarterbacking, it allows Matt Lafleur to really execute his system maybe more than he was ever able to do with Aaron Rodgers, who in a lot of ways still sort of called the shots. And you look at the NFC right now, Dave. The Packers and the Vikings are in a playoff spot. And I can tell you that New Year's Eve, I'm thinking about doing it. I know a lot of people here going down Jets Wild at 1 p.m. and then Packers Vikings at 7:20 at TC Bank Stadium. Um, that game could easily be a loser leaves town match where a team is out um, because I do think that Detroit, with that win comfortably, yeah. they're winning that division. But there are plenty of scenarios that have both the Vikings and the Packers potentially in a wild card spot with the extra spot now. Yeah, it's really hard when you look at the schedule to try to spot what games are going to be meaningless on that, that last day of the year. And then the last week of the regular season, week 17 is the next week. I think January 7th is actually the final day of the uh, of the regular season. There are so many different scenarios that it's I mean, usually you can look ahead at this stage of the season and start to anticipate what games are going to mean, what, where. And this is just totally, totally wide open. And And I yeah, it's. It's it's been a weird year because teams that we thought that were going to be in rebuilding stage are challenging for the playoffs. And I mean, you know, teams are just like Houston and Indianapolis, like teams that were picking quarterbacks in the top five last year. You know, you, you don't think of those as teams that are challenging for playoffs, particularly in Indianapolis's case, because they don't even have the guy that they selected. And and then you've got teams, you know, like Buffalo being the best example of it that you know are supposed to be in a Super Bowl window and are are clinging to playoff life and have to beat some teams that are higher than them in the standings in order, in order to get back into it. So I can't remember a year quite like this in the NFL where there's just been so much of that. And, and again, like the, you know, Jordan love early in the year, they look great. No, uh, you know, I just think there's so much of a rush to judgment on, on younger quarterbacks. And, and yes, he's, he'd been in their system for a couple of years, but that that's helping him. Now the playtime is still necessary. And, First, Green Bay has used this model before, and I just wonder whether we might see some other teams use it. You know, rather than the plug-and-play, desperate quarterback team, the teams that have a quarterback with a year or two left on his deal that they're going to let their guys sit and groom and play him. I know that's hard to do when you're picking in the top five. It's a little easier when you're picking at the back of this first round or something like that. But I think there's a lesson in what Green Bay's done with Jordan Love. Well, and I mean, listen, Mahomes is a great example of that as well. I mean, uh, you know, he was picked. He sat behind Alex Smith for that entire rookie season, mm -hmm. started game 17 uh, after they'd clinched. It was clear that he was ready to go, and uh, then they made the switch in the offseason. But tell you what, for Nathan Rourke, we can look around, and I kind of joked about that quarterback matchup that we've got in that god-awful primetime game this weekend. I mean, a guy like Rourke, if he was in a different situation, probably plays significant amounts on – 10 teams in the league this year. Well, Farhan Lalsi and I talk about that all the time, but what a lottery you know, grab it is, right? And look, I would say it turns some heads when he signed in Jacksonville because Trevor Lawrence was 23 at the time. Probably still is 23 or 24 now. Uh, you know, had never missed a game to injury in, until this week if he misses that one. He's as much of a franchise quarterback as they're in the league. I don't think a lot of people had Jacksonville on their bingo card for Nathan Rourke to find a place because there's no path to number one. What I think he was expecting was an opportunity to compete for number two, which he didn't get by the time he got to training camp. And I think he got more money, as much or more money guaranteed by going to Jacksonville as anywhere else, which is usually an indication of how serious a team is at you. But it really is, it is a total wild card. You know, when you look at what how some depth charts just crumble and all of a sudden an undrafted free agent is starting games. And yet, you know, Nathan Rourke had, I think, one game off the practice roster. So, you know, the, the, the randomness of injuries, which – as part of football has 
come to Jacksonville, and now the path has opened up a little bit for Nathan Mark. And again, it's I don't think it's impossible that he could be one of these guys who be a very important player in the last month of the NFL season, depending on how this goes here. But yeah, you, you just see the attrition of quarterbacks around the league, and the and the number of guys of you know, unspectacular pedigree and draft position who are getting opportunities to play. Uh, I I I can imagine how frustrating that is for Nathan Mark. Not that he's not a team guy, but uh, you know, he's a player. He's a football player. He hasn't spent a lot of his life watching from the sidelines. Uh, I, I could even see frustration on his face sometime when I was at training camp this summer. And, you know, they did a they did a day where it was a live practice against the Lions uh, with the, the joint practice with the Detroit Lions. And I think Nathan Mark threw two passes, you know, in three hours. And, you know, you can see that's not that, you know, that's not what he wants to be doing. He wants to be playing. And, uh, you know, again, without w- wishing any ill you know, on Trevor Lawrence or, or C.J. Beathard. He's just a guy who's wired to play football. And I'm sure seeing all the opportunities that guys who he probably considers himself, you know, equal or better than getting those opportunities, I, I'm sure that's been frustrating to him over the course of this season. Nails, great shot. Buckle up for Pat Steelers on Thursday night, and uh, that'll that'll <laughs> whet your appetite for what should be uh, hopefully a pretty good uh, game between the Chiefs and Bills on Sunday. Did you see the over under in that game? You see what that is? Yeah, isn't it 30, 30. and a half or 31? I, I cannot remember ever seeing 30. That's the only the only smaller number I've ever seen is the 28 on the board for the Army Navy game on I was Saturday. Gonna say, like that those, <laughs> those yeah, you get weirdo college games that are, you know, playing running offenses from the 1920s or something. Yes. But in an NFL game in this era, 30 and a half my goodness. Anyway. That's- Yikes. Thanks for doing this, dude. Great to uh, great to catch up as always. Hey, my pleasure, Oscar. Thanks for having me on. Take right care. Right on. There's uh, the man himself, Dave Naylor, joining us. And uh, Dave will be covering that big Bills Chiefs game coming up this week for uh, TSN. Hey, i got to give a big shout out to our pal DQ Nick. Looking forward to uh, seeing him tomorrow night down at Little Brown Jug. And as always, um, Nick, great supporter of ours. And all you WSTers. He's going to be bringing a little DQ ice cream treats for us to uh, mix in with a few LBJ loggers. Of course, DQ ice cream cakes for any and every occasion ready for you from Nick and Nikki with the DQ on Northgate. And, of course, you can also visit them at the mall with the Orange Julius over at Polo Park. Um, but maybe your best way to do it, if you do want to order a DQ cake for the holiday season or for a gathering, just hit them up on Instagram at DQ Manitoba. They'll custom make it for you, take care of it. And don't forget, they've also got the uh, Pita Pit out in Niverville now. So if you've got some... Uh, PETA needs great catering options. You can hit them up on Twitter X at PETA Pit Neverville and uh, make sure to join us tomorrow for a little DQ and say hi to Nick amongst with the rest of the DQ or the WST crew. Um, and of course, that's happening tomorrow night. Our great partners at Little Brown Jug host in the big event. If you haven't already got your tickets, folks, please do before they're gone. In the description, we've got a link. I believe Remus has it pinned in the chat. If you're on the podcast, go to winnipegsportstalk.com. Tickets, I believe, are $11.98. Every cent is going to the Christmas cheer board. And bring uh, bring 10 or 20 bucks if you want to get in on our raffle. Uh, we've got a great package of merchandise and beer from Little Brown Jug. Just picked up a framed autographed Kyle Connor picture, an autographed Kyle Connor puck, a beautiful Jets hoodie and toque from our friends at the Jets and working on a couple of other additions uh, to make it a great one. So tomorrow, Little Brown Jug, 7 p.m. Uh, we'll throw a few slices around as well from our friends at Boston Pizza. Support the cheer board and have a great time as we get into this holiday season. And, of course, all holiday season, some great deals at Little Brown Jug. Uh, you'll be able to see those tomorrow as well. Um, but if you buy, I believe, it, uh, a case of cans and you can mix and match. Now, you get a $15 gift card for the tap room as well. Um, find out more at littlebrownjug.ca and, of course, give them a follow on Instagram and Twitter for the latest holiday deals from Winnipeg's favorite local beer, LBJ, heading into the Christmas season. All right, um, I want to talk Otani with Michael Remus, but we kicked off the conversation with Dave talking about the Blue Bombers, and uh, the first domino fell, Willie Jefferson is back for another year with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. 
Uh, and Willie spoke earlier today. Uh, we've got a couple clips that we'll just uh, drop in for you. Let's start it off with Willie saying it didn't matter that he was first to sign after losing the Grey Cup. Didn't really matter, like, who was first. Uh, doesn't really matter who's the last signing either. Like, you know, uh, trying to build something special. You know, the culture here is is great. The atmosphere here is great. The fans are great. The organization's wonderful. These, these clips are good. Okay, do them all. I'm just happy that, nope. you know, we were oh. able to get the deal done. No dilly-dally, you know, no uh, hesitations and things like that. Uh, they, I knew what I wanted, and the team was ready to, you know, give me everything I wanted, plus a little bit more, and, you know, I'm happy, satisfied, all of the above. Uh, Willie J. Ream, uh, I, I could listen to Willie talk about anything, to be honest, but uh, that sounds like a pretty happy Winnipeg Blue Bomber to be back. Everything he wanted, uh, plus a little bit more. I wonder if a little bit more included that uh, retro Bombers jacket. He's rocking. Cause Straight fire. Man, uh, does he look good here. And uh, he's got the hat as well. I love that uh, vintage Bombers logo. So, uh, Will, he's lo looking pretty good and uh, pretty happy after signing the new deal. No doubt about it. Uh, Willie also said, uh, well, he was asked if it was easier or harder to decide to return right away after, uh, you know, their second straight L in the big game. Is it easier or harder to return after two lost great cups? It is null and void. Like, in the past? yeah, like uh, the first one was tough. The second one was tough, you know, uh, great seasons. Great guys, built some things throughout the season, just didn't finish the way we wanted to. Love the... We love the, the fans that came to all the home games, to the Great Cup games and things like that, traveling and things like that, showing their support. It means the, the world to us as a team. And Again, man, like, uh, I've had to sit with that, just that thought, you know, for whatever it's been, like two weeks, I think now, or whatever. So uh, I'm not mad, I'm not sad, I'm not disappointed or anything like that. Like, like I was telling my, my friends and my families and things like that, like a lot of guys don't even get to make it to a great cup, right? A lot of guys have amazing careers, but never get to make it to a great cup, never get to win a great cup. I've had the opportunity to win two back-to-back -back with a great organization, with some great guys, build some relationships and things like that. So going to four great cups, you know, and then losing the last two, you know, uh, it is what it is. It's football. You win some, you lose some. We played a great team. We played a great game. It is what it is. You know, just hope to be back to that to that uh, position again with some with some different guys and hopefully come out with a better outcome. But I'm happy with everything. You know, the re-signing. Happy with the the way 2023 played out. Not the way it ended, but the way it played out. Do it again. All right, a little more from Willie Jefferson. That, that was an extended answer, but um, very introspective from uh, Willie. Obviously, he and his beautiful young family have um, really fit in very well in Winnipeg. Um, Willie was asked if he thought Winnipeg would become such a home for him when he signed here in 2019. I had no idea that this would be the place that I would spend my longest tenure as a player. I knew coming here in 2019 that I wanted to be a part of something great. Be a, you know, just that. Like being with Coach O'Shea, being with Coach Richie. Uh, you know, Kyle, Wade. I'm just, I'm just here 
and just living a dream. You know, I wake up every morning want to be great, want to come into this building and, you know, want to spread excellence around. That's what I've been doing since 2019, and that's what I'm going to do until, you know, I'm out of here. All right, and one more from Willie. Um, just sort of on top of that, um, he was asked pretty simply, what is the appeal What is, uh, um, that Winnipeg brings to him professionally as well as for uh, for his family? What appeals to me living in Winnipeg year round? Just me being from Texas, adapting to a different climate, a different setting. Like I'm used to it being like 70 degrees Christmas time. Um, just to wake up in the morning and look out my window or open my door and see snow, see frost on the trees. At nighttime, see snow falling out my window with my daughters and things like that. It's, it's great. It's something that I never experienced as a kid. It's something that I'm happy to let my kids experience and things like that. So I'm just embracing all the things that are different about Winnipeg that's in Texas, you know? Like, I love to go home, I love to visit. I miss the food, I miss the weather, I miss the atmosphere, I miss friends, I miss family. But to be here in Winnipeg with the fans, the organization, uh, my teammates that stay around in the off season, Adam, Dembski, for the most part, you know, like, I'm here, you know, I, I love it. My family loves it. We embrace it. All right, so there's Willie J. I see Spency in chat. I want to take him to Festival. I don't know whether Willie's ever done Festival de Voyager, but he would, and you know Willie would dive straight in, Reem. I mean, he'd get one of those fur hats on. I mean, he would, uh, much like he's done to this city and to this organization, I think Willie would dive in. Um, but some great stuff uh, on just how Winnipeg has become home for his family. And um, listen, you get a guy like that signed to an extension, and there is something to be said for having a star player like Willie Jefferson make he and his family's home here in Winnipeg year-round. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty cool, Huss, and I'm sure it's a great uh, recruiting tool as well to have him here. And, uh, then, and he mentioned you know, the number of players that do live here year-round have made it their home, and he's been an impact player here since... He signed in 2019. I remember when, you know, they brought him into uh, the old station house and, like, he could barely fit through the door. Uh, he was so tall. Uh, I was – I couldn't believe it. Like, when you get <laughs> it beside Willie Jefferson for the first time, yeah, you realize that you're uh, – you're, I mean, th this is an alpha male, uh, a human, a specimen – Oh. Um, that, um, well, it just makes you very happy not to be a quarterback on one of the other eight teams in the Canadian Football League. Well, yeah, 100%. So, uh, look, CFL offseason, we talked to the Ed a couple weeks ago. It was like, it's year-round, and the signings are, are coming in, and there's the first one, Willie, but a lot more work left for GM Kyle Walters. Yes, indeed. Speaking of GMs, uh, we'll get to the cool bet lines in just a second. Um, can we get an update on Otani Watch? Um, because which is quite, we had a real fun chat today in the lock shop for everyone that jumped on Otani to the Jays at 25 to one. When I brought it up last Tuesday, uh, about an hour and a half later, it dropped to five to one. And we're now looking at odds as low as plus 150 right now, Remo. There is some legitimate steam to these rumors that the Jays are very much in the mix, including a reported meeting between Otani, his agent, and the Blue Jays. Yeah, this is getting serious. We're tracking, okay, where's the Blue Jays management? Uh, they're asking John Schneider at a press conference today about his tan, uh, you know, speculating that he was in Florida at this reported meeting between Otani and Ross Atkins. What, Ross Atkins is doing Zoom calls with a white wall? behind him so people don't know his appearance he live did. from parts unknown yeah he was not at the at uh the winter meetings in nashville that's why uh this is happening right now and the word was that otani wanted all the meetings and everything to be very hush hush but uh dave roberts the dodgers manager came out to today and said 
They met with Otani at Dodger Stadium a couple of days ago. Uh, I don't know if Otani should be DQ'd. They yeah. should be DQ'd for that breach of trust. <laughs> and uh, the rumors are Otani's going to what well, they met them met the Jays at Florida at their complex, and then you know people are tracking private jets. You know, one went from California to Florida. One went from Florida to uh, Nashville. Uh, this Otani watch getting getting very serious, and it does appear that what it's down to the Jays, Dodgers, or the Cubs. In hold on, uh, let me. I don't know. Those those are the teams that are reportedly. I mean, the Dodgers and the, if you're just following the money and looking at the odds, it's L.A. has been the favorite throughout this, but it's gone up a little bit as Toronto's come down, and um, those are reportedly the two uh, the two favorites. Yeah, I think it's which is crazy, and I don't know. Like, would he actually go to Toronto? Jays fans are dreaming. I wonder if they're gonna get. Get hurt, Huss, but it is. You don't see like players this kind of big free agent, maybe the biggest you know free agent ever, go and what is this contract going to be? This is very very fascinating. T. Will just the Jays are going to pay Otani six hundred million <laughs> if they can. Yeah, I mean this guy's a franchise changer. He won't pitch next year, but after that, presumably we'll be able to come and pitch, and. Like let's let's think about Rogers um, Sports and Entertainment. Um, this is a massive company. The market for Canada or the market for the Jays is the entire country. Like, th there's nothing that would move the needle more than this. Dusty suggested that if Otani signed with the Jays, it probably would be the biggest transaction in Canadian sports history as far as moving the needle. And I, I can't disagree. Well, I mean, this guy's an international star. He's what itches, he hits. He's you know one of the he's the best baseball player out there. If he's doing both, um, and so if, yeah, if they signed him, it would be a massive, massive free agent contract. Would make huge news, and you know everyone's cell cell phone bill would just go up a little bit, and I'm sure that would that would pay for. It. I mean, they have, I mean, Rogers. They basically have. Uh, what unlimited? I don't want to say unlimited money, but they have tons. It's a huge company. They own the team. They own you know the telephone and internet in Canada, um, and they own the channel that the games are on. So there's a, a lot of a lot of money available, and time for them to go reach into the pockets and pull some of it out and give it to Shohei Otani. And is Otani going to take their offer? Is he going to take the Dodgers' offer? Offer. Uh, this is very fascinating. Is it ever? Is it ever? Um, and I'll tell you what, they get Otani signed to a deal. Everyone forgets about the disaster in the playoffs last year with John Schneider, Yank and Berrios and all that. And I think the the excitement would be literally at an all-time high. And there's been a lot of excitement around this team for the last couple of years. Uh, and it sounds like they're very much in the mix for Soto, but Otani is the unicorn. That's the number one choice. And, uh, We'll be following that as we uh, as the week uh, the week continues. Um, let's get to the cool bet lines before we're done. Pretty busy night in the National Hockey League. Uh, the Kings are in Seabus to take on the Blue Jackets. PLD line A. I think I saw in the chat people were saying that was on the tube. You can check that one out. The Kings, a great record so far, 14-4 and three through 21 games. They are minus 229 road favorite. Uh, the Rangers are minus 150 faves on the road in Ottawa to take on the Senators. Detroit's minus 134 against the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, the Sharks are, as usual, a big underdog, plus 250. Islanders minus 304. Uh, the Preds minus 188 road favorites against Connor Bedard and the Blackhawks. Minnesota, a slight road favorite against the Calgary Flames at minus 116. Avalanche... Coming off a couple losses, looking to repay the uh, Ducks for beating them on the weekend. Avalanche minus 254 at home. Kale McCarr not confirmed to play yet tonight. And then this will be cool, man. All three Hughes blue, uh, brothers playing in the same game, Reem. Uh, this one pretty much a pick on Vancouver, a very slight favorite over the Devils. Uh, but uh, there'll be a lot of money on the board in both dressing rooms, I think, from uh, players last named Hughes. Yeah, big total in that one, too. The highest total in the night, seven. You don't see too many sevens. And, you know, Devils goaltending has, has not been great. 
uh, not been great at all this season. And I, you know, Vancouver, they've put a lot of pucks in the back of the net. So I am anticipating a lot of goals in this one. Although Vancouver's goaltending has been certainly been solid. Yeah, no doubt about it. Well, um, that is going to be a fun game to watch tonight. Uh, tomorrow, we uh, it's a perfect day to get together at LBJ because the Jets are off. They'll be traveling tomorrow. And then Thursday, Jets in Colorado. Looking forward to that one. Uh, again, we hope to see you all tomorrow, especially you folks in the chat that kind of are a big part of the community, but podcast listeners as well. Grab your ticks. Join us tomorrow, 7 p.m., Little Brown Jug. Descript- the link is in the description and um, obviously on the podcast as well. <laughs> Just about at the finish line here as I slowly but surely get over this cough. Um, thanks to all the sponsors that make this show happen every day and all of you for making us a part of yours. See you tomorrow at 1 for WST and then 7 at Little Brown Jug. Have a great night. Oh, my God. Oh! Shut it down! Let's go home! Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.